Stumbling Company, 1025, 1063 The Game, streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. Ian is here today. Hello, Ian. What up, what up? I heard Brian Callahan's press conference today, very detailed. Cannot say that I not, am, am surprised by that. I think Brian Callahan, it's really crazy listening to Brian Callahan talk. Because on one hand, Brian Callahan seems like such a nice, likable, honest dude. And I have no idea if he's any of those things, but that is what he seems like. And then on the other hand, there's a couple times in there where Brian Callahan makes it known. You know, hey, this is how we're going to do things around here. And that I like. So we'll get to him and we'll get to that later on. But I want to start on last night's Predators game. They clinched. And into the playoffs they go. So, for all you people out there that when they lost in the streak was, oh, Jared, I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. And I'm a... Let me just tell you this. The Predators, by about the midway point of that streak, when they beat Colorado, the day that Barry Trott said he decided he was going to be a seller, that team was going to make playoffs. And now they have. But I think that we need to talk about both, about both the good and the bad that came out of last night's game. Because I'm going to be completely honest with you. I cannot tell you how you should feel about last night's game. I don't even know what they think you should feel about last night's game. All I can tell you is what I felt about last night's game and the awkwardness of they clinched a playoff spot. It was a good game. Really entertaining. They came back, but they lost. So the good, we'll start with this. We'll go good, we'll go bad, we'll go good, we'll go bad. The good, they clinched a playoff spot. And this is the honeymoon year for the Predators, so we didn't expect them to clinch a playoff spot. Barry Trotz came on the program, and he said at the beginning of the year, fans, stick with us. A lot of fans in the text line, when the Predators started to turn it around, said, Jared, you still believe embrace the tank now? And what's hilarious about that, is that Barry Trotz said on the show at that point when they got back from that road trip and they lost to that terrible Anaheim team at home and that terrible Arizona team at home, Barry said that they were thinking, oh, we might have a top five pick this year. Oh, it's not going to be very good. But they made the playoffs. They got hot. They won the big games. They won them when they mattered. They beat good teams. They've played tough the last couple of weeks. They're in. And this isn't 2022 where that team had no chance. That team barely made the playoffs at the end of the year after playing great hockey at the beginning of the year. The team completely fell apart all the way down the stretch. And they ended up making the playoffs and it was not very pretty. This is the opposite. This team started off in a slump, made their way back into the mix, slumped again, and then got hot. And now they're headed into the playoffs with a couple more games to go. So that's the good. They clinch the playoff spot, get a couple of home dates, put some money in the pockets of the owners. The fans will have a good time. Who knows? Might be two home games. Might be ten. We've seen this both sides. So the good, they clinch a playoff spot. The bad, and I think that this is even ahead of the fact that they lost the game last night, but the bad was, I thought, two really bad lapses in the first period on back-to-back goals by Winnipeg. I'm not talking about the Velarde goal because that one, Ian, what'd you think of that? Pretty nice. I mean, the guy has literally got his back to the goalie, and he flips the puck and goes top shelf into the opposite corner in between his legs. Magic Johnson couldn't score that goal. So I got no problem with the first goal. I mean, that's one where I'm like, look, man, there's nothing you can do about this. Like, there's nothing Soros could do about it. There's nothing anybody else on the ice could do. You know me. I am not a, well, you know, they pay the other guys too kind of guy. But that goal, I mean, tip of the cap, holy crap, that was incredible. The other two were disappointing. Specifically, the Forsberg turnover that led to the second goal. And Soros had no shot on that. And then we talked to Barry yesterday on the show. Adam Vinken wrote an article at Sportsnet basically about how the biggest problem the Predators have had since they've been on this run is they're allowing way too many wide-open shots from the slot, 
And what did they end up doing to some Scarbini defenseman that's standing right there in the slot? Bang, right in the back of the net, now it's 3-1. And the Predators were chasing the game the entire time because of those two horrendous plays that set up Winnipeg goals. And if this is the playoffs, and again, this is a team that's going to be in the playoffs, and now you're in the playoffs, and so if this is the playoffs, that gets you beat. That right there, those two momentary lapses, a turnover at the blue line that leads to an easy breakaway, followed by a wide-open, unprotected slot in which they just put it right in the back of the net, you lose. And I don't like that. Early in the game, get your heads out of your tushes and do not give up those kind of plays. So that was bad. Then there was the good news that they came back, right? 3-1. We've talked about it with this team. This team does not quit. They did not quit during the season. They do not quit in games. Down 4-1 against Vegas, they didn't quit. Last night, they did not quit. And I'm not going to do the whole five on five, they played better, or they outshot Winnipeg 75 to 20. And I'm not going to do that. But they did fight last night. They really fought to get back in the game when, again, a much mentally weaker team very easily could have said, screw it, pack it up, get on the plane, let's go to Chicago, kick the crap out of them, they suck, get our points, get onto the playoffs. They doomed themselves with those mistakes in the first period, and they spent the entire rest of the game getting back in it and redeeming themselves. And again, that's what wins your cups in the playoffs. I know you're going to say, hold on, wait a minute, wins your cups? The 2015 Blackhawks series. Remember, the Predators had a 3-0 lead in Game 1. Corey Crawford got pulled, Scott Darling got put in, and the Predators lost in overtime. Blew a 3-0 lead. Predators blew leads in Game 4 and in Game 6. Chicago won the Cup that year. You're going to have to have a couple of those. In fact, the Predators in 2018 at Winnipeg And in 2017 in the cup final, game five, they got their butts kicked in the first period and they could not get themselves back in the game. So you're going to have to do that at some point in the playoffs if you want to win the cup. So I got to say, I really like that. The fact that they came back and they tied that game. But then the bad part is they couldn't finish the deal in overtime. You give up a two-on-one. With Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley, you lose. And that's exactly what happened last night. The Predators had good possession. You know, I was a little disappointed because I think that in three-on-three overtime, the initial trio that the Predators start with, O'Reilly, Forsberg, and Yossi, is as good as any trio anybody can put out there in the league, add Soros to it, and it might be the best three skaters and a goalie in the league three-on-three overtime. And I didn't feel like they dominated the possession the way that I'm used to those three guys dominating possession in overtime. I thought it was sloppy with their puck movement. You know, there were times where they were uh, driving to the net. You know, Nyquist had made a nice move on a guy, and he's trying to look for somebody to kick it back to, and then the puck goes behind the blue line, and now they got to retreat. I just, I did not like the three-on-three overtime, and they couldn't finish the deal. And then we also have to talk about why Spencer Stastny's on the ice in overtime, which is another different discussion. But here comes Shifley and Connor, and it's a two-on-one. They're going to score. And they did. And so you did all that work to get back in that game, and you still couldn't finish the deal. And I know there's no three-on-three overtime in the playoffs, but when you get to overtime in the playoffs, you can't give up a two-on-one with Shifley and Connor. You can't give up a two-on-one with one of the 520 goal scorers the Dallas Stars have. You can't give up a two-on-one with Besser and Pedersen in Vancouver. Can't do it. You lose. So I didn't like that. But the other thing that I think we have to take into account, I think this was a good thing that happened yesterday. Again, we got some good, we got some bad. Connor Hellebuck was on his A game yesterday. You know, I thought Soros was good last night in net. I didn't think he was incredible. But I thought he was good in net last night. Connor Hellebuck was on his A game. 
And I know these teams talk about how, well, you know, Vegas didn't have a goalie last year and uh, Colorado didn't really have a goalie the year before, and so maybe goalie's not that important. I mean, Connor Hellebuck almost stole that game last night. But again, you want to win in the playoffs, you're going to have to have the nights where you beat a top goalie on his A game. Just like Pecorine got beat in game six of the 2017 Cup Final when he was on his A game. Just like, again, Rene's been beaten before. Win on his A game, 2019 at Dallas. That game got to overtime. The only reason Dallas scored in regulation was because of a P.K. Subban lazy turnover. And all of a sudden, you're in overtime. You hit a post. They put it in. You lose. So Connor Hellebuck had his A game. You spotted him three goals in the first period. And you still found a way to break through. Incredibly impressive against one of the best goalies in the league. And again, that's what you'll see in the playoffs. And then finally, the bad, you lost the game. And at this point in the year, we can talk about, well, against St. Louis, they didn't have their best game. They didn't play well five on five, but Soros was great. And then between the power play and the penalty kill, they were able to eke out two points in a game they had to have to send St. Louis packing. Great. Well, against Boston, they played even with a legitimate cup contender. The Bruins are the real deal. And, you know, it's a bad pass on the power play, and Charlie Coyle takes it for a breakaway on the other side, and you lose. Okay, fine, whatever. None of that matters in the playoffs. In the playoffs, all that matters is whether or not you win. I've talked about this time and time again. The Predators were dominated in Game 6 of the Western Conference Final in 2017. Go look it up. But Pecorine was awesome. And between that and a puck hitting off of Montour's skate going into the net and goalie issues for Anaheim and a Colton Sisson's hat trick, which is about as rare as an eclipse, you won the game and won it pretty handedly. All that matters is whether or not you win. That's what happens when you get to the playoffs. And so now, because the Predators are in the playoffs, that's all that matters to me. The little things that win or lose you the games, and whether or not once you get on the road to Dallas, once you get on the road to Vancouver, are you going to win or lose those games? And last night you lost. Again, you did what you were supposed to do, You got the point. You're in the playoffs. You played great, relentless hockey. You never gave up. Still lost. That can't happen in the playoffs. So I can't tell you how to feel, but that's how I feel. Very mixed emotions about last night's game. 615-737-1025 615-737-1025 is our phone number. 615-737-1025. We will get to your phones plus. Barry Trotz came on our program and made a proclamation yesterday that I'll give him this year. We'll do that next. Stoneman and Company, 615-737-1025 is our phone number if you want to weigh in. Again, that phone number is 615-737-1025. Stoneman and Company, 1025, 106 for the game.
I mean, if I'm whoever's playing us, all the pressure's on them. I'm not. I'm not saying that just to to be coy or or to to start the uh, the playoff talk already, but uh, it's true. No one expected us to be here, except us. And uh, you know, we're probably not going to be a favorite in the series or any series we play. So, you know, let's play free. Let's play with uh, with no pressure, and let's go after someone. There you go. That was Barry Trotz on our show yesterday. And Barry was like, look, we're not going to be favored. We weren't supposed to be in the playoffs. I came on the show at the beginning of the year, and I told you guys, the fans, I said, hey, be patient with us this year. It might be might be a little tough. And for you guys out there like you, Jared Stillman, you were the one that's been begging for years for a rebuild. And we told you guys, hey, if we rebuild, like, it's going to be painful. And, you know, it's going to be a little tough now. So we got nothing to lose this year. Vancouver will be favored. Dallas will be favored. And they should be favored, by the way. So we got nothing to lose. Let's let it rip. Play free. Play easy. I think Barry was saying that because, well, Barry doesn't want anybody to put any extra pressure on themselves when they don't have to. Teams that have the we have nothing to lose mentality can be very dangerous teams. And with all of his years of coaching, I'm going to guess Barry's got a pretty good feel for these things, that Barry knows, hey, when it's time to stick my foot up somebody's tush, I'll do it. And when it's time for me to dial it back and say, hey, hey, we got no pressure, I'll do that too. So I'll take his word at it. But I'm going to say this. He's right. They have nothing to lose this year. This year. And this is the only year of this that I'll be okay with. Because this is the honeymoon period. They weren't supposed to make the playoffs. We didn't even think they would make the playoffs. We told them on the front end it was okay to not make the playoffs. But this can't be something every year where it's like, no pressure on us. Because, as I've said many times, and I had to keep explaining during the last coaching staff, we want to win. We don't want to almost win. And so we want the Predators to be competing for the Cup. This year has been a great surprise. And I've learned in my life, whether it's the 2000 Titans or the 2019 Titans, a bona fide Super Bowl contender that got knocked out in the divisional round of the playoffs to a 9-7 and team that got in on the last game of the year because the Houston Texans rested everybody and ended up in the AFC Championship game with a 17-7 lead. There's no way to predict when the big moment's going to come or when it's not. And so for this year, I'm fine with nothing to lose. But I'm not okay with it in subsequent years. In subsequent years, you know, want to build on what this team's done and build on it for next year. And I know it's not linear, and everybody used to keep making a big deal about that. 15, they lost in the first round. 16, they lost in the second round. 17, they lost in the cup final. 18, they lost in the second round. 19, they lost in the first round. 20, they lost in the bubble before the first round. And I'm like, guys, that's a nice narrative to show this, you know, linear growth and decline. But I don't really think that's accurate. You know, again, these series all have their own different stories. But, I mean, I do expect the Predators next year to be good. And I expect the Predators to be somewhat similar to the Boston Bruins from the standpoint that the Bruins had a little reset in there. You know, they won the Cup in 11. They were in the Cup final in 13. They won the President's Trophy in 14. And then around, you know, 15, 16, 17, they were kind of resetting the deck a little bit. And then 18, 19, and so on, they've been competing for the Cup. And that's what I expect from the Predators. But I'll give Barry, he's right. This year, they've got nothing to lose. Now, nobody expected anything out of Vancouver either, so I don't know if Vancouver can say the same thing or not. But Dallas, they might win the President's Trophy. This might be their year, and there will be more pressure on them. So I'm okay with this for this year. Phone lines are by WilsonCountyHunter.com, 615-737-1025. Jay has been waiting patiently and is going to kick us off today on the Predators. Thank you for calling. Thank you for waiting. Go ahead, Jay. Hey, Jared. Love the show, man. I'll be quick. Just got an observation for you. Kind of seemed like this was on the tip of your tongue before the break, but if I'm the coaching staff for the Preds, I've got to pound it into these guys that even before the opening faceoff, before the puck hits the ice, you're down two, guys. You're down 2-0 before we even start. Because when you're down, 
you play harder, you play cleaner. So if I'm the staff, I'm, I'm pounding that into their heads. Guys, you're down 2-0, go play your heads off because that's when you play your best. Just want to hear your thoughts on that, Jared. Yeah, so I think that's probably why he's been starting that line, you know, since they got good with McCarron and Sherwood and Cole Smith because it's like, I want the grit, I want the tenacity, I want the fannies on fire as soon as we drop this puck. I think there's something to that. I don't know what has been the issue for the starts the last couple of nights, but I mean, New Jersey brought the puck right down the ice and scored on the first shot on Sunday. And that could have cost you that game. And last night, I mean, you got up ahead early, but last night, I mean, just mental gaffes by got Forsberg with a turnover around the blue line. I don't know, you know, certain starting pitchers. You know, I'm a huge Braves fan, and so I reference the Braves a lot. Tom Glavin was in the Hall of Fames, won 300 games, was just the consummate, consistent pitcher over his career. And the old saying was him was if you were going to get him, get him in the first inning. Because once he got in a groove, he was fine. I don't think that this is something that is – going to linger about these early slower starts but there is something that's up with this team where you know against st louis they score 30 seconds into the game and then they just went right to crap for the for the rest of the period and i'm like wait a minute what are we what are we doing here this doesn't make any sense so i don't really know what the coaching staff supposed to do about that i mean again i think when he puts that grinder line out there to begin the game it's like hey we're all in but at the same time It is a concern because, like I said with those goals in the first period last night, you do that in the playoffs, you lose. Maybe you can dig yourself out of it once or twice. You can't dig yourself out of it every night. And the Predators lately have done a little too much of that. You know, kind of having these moments where sloppy plays in the D zone really hurt them. You know, one that comes to mind is Fabro in the Colorado game where trying to get the puck out, he had a guy behind him who was pressuring him, and he just put the puck against the board, just basically hot potato, just get it away from me, put the puck against the board, and I believe it was Trennan who picked it up and put it in the net. And it's like, dude, chill out. These D-zone turnovers are going to kill you. And they've just had some moments where these things start to snowball a little bit. That happened last night. 615-737-1025. 615-737-1025. More of your phone. 615-737-1025 plus. I got to tip my cap to something that happened last night. I mean, holy smokes. We'll do that coming up next and your phones here on Stillman and Company. Chris Sanders will join us later this hour, of course, as he always does on a Wednesday. Let's talk about FanDuel Sportsbook. That's right. FanDuel Sportsbook is my official sportsbook app. Bet the NBA with a no-sweat same-game parlay from FanDuel every Thursday with a TNT Thursday. That means it's tomorrow. It does not matter if you're new to FanDuel or if you already have an account. You'll get bonus bets back if your same-game parlay does not win on any NBA on TNT game. NBA same game parlays are the perfect way to combine your bets for a chance to score a bigger payday. Or if you're somebody like me, it's a chance for you to care about an NBA game. However you want to play, head to FanDuel.com slash JGM to bet the NBA with a no sweat same game parlay on TNT Thursdays. That's FanDuel.com slash JGM and make every moment more with FanDuel an official betting partner of the NBA. 21 and over in present in Tennessee. Minimum three leg parlay required. Refund issued is not withdrawable bonus bets which expires seven days after receipt. Max refunds $5 unless otherwise specified. Restrictions do apply. See terms at sportsbook.fandle.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 
to the right wing corner. Twisted back now. Try to get it down in front. Out at the blue line. Morrissey backhands across. Thrown in front. And a shot in the score. What a beautiful conversion in front. Gabe Velarde just got the puck on his backhand and flipped it up and in. There you go. That was Pete Weber on the call last night. So that Gabe Velarde goal, I, I just want to take a second to appreciate greatness. You know, I think I've been doing this long enough. Sports is very tribal, as is politics. You know, I want my team to win. And if there's something I don't like, it's that the other guys cheated and my team is always right and mine is my guys are good and their guys are bad and mine are. And every now and then, I'll be at a Titans game and I'll watch an opposing player, Joe Burrow sometimes. I'll watch him make a play and I'll just shrug my shoulders and say, I mean, you know, what are you going to do about it? Last night, Gabe Velarde with the puck in front of the net. If there's anything that you could say the Predators could have done differently, it's that Velarde was literally standing right in front of the goalie with no opposition at all from any gold shirts. So if there's anything you want to fire off and say, okay, this I have a problem with, that could be it. But Velarde with his back to Soros flips the puck from in between his legs onto the top shelf of the opposite corner of the net. I don't want to be somebody who says, that's the nastiest goal I've ever seen. Because I've seen a lot of goals in my life, but it's up there. And, Ian, i got to be honest with you, when it comes to Gabe Velarde. Yeah. I don't know who that is. Yeah. You know, that he does not pass the Jared Stillman trade smell test of, oh, is he a good player? Have I ever heard of him? I have no idea who the hell this guy is. And that goal he put in the back of the net last night had to have been a fluke. I mean, that was just incredible. And yet, I've never heard of the guy. Robbie says he was involved in that Pierre-Luc Dubois trade. Which yeah, I find, he's a youngster. I, I find, How old is Velarde? Uh, let's see. He was a first round pick 11th overall in the 2017 draft. So he's 24, almost 25. So, you know, some of those guys take a little bit. I just say this, that in between the legs, that will whoop, 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 right into the top corner. Just a thing of beauty. Six one five seven three seven one zero two five. By the way, I do want to remind folks that tonight the uh, Smashville live shows at brew house South or excuse me, brew house 100, not brew house South. Brew House 100 in Bellevue tonight at 6 o'clock. The Predators will, uh, the, you know, our player show. It'll have Ryan McDonough and Luke Shin. Smashville Live brought to you by the Black Abbey Brewing Company and ESPN Bet Sportsbook. Plus, Fan Appreciation Night is on Saturday. Ian, there's a dunk tank on Saturday out on the plaza. Okay. I assume this is for charity. Mm-hmm. They have asked if I want to do it. Oh, okay. What do we think? Well, that is up to you, but. Do we think it'll raise a lot of money for charity Probably. if I sit on a dunk tank on the plaza Saturday night for 30 minutes? Can't hurt. I mean, it can hurt. There could be more people that they would well, spend could... money on and to try to dunk in the tank. And again, I, I don't know if it's for charity or not. Maybe it's free. I have no idea. But I don't know. I am considering it. Okay. So if you are somebody that wants to bitch at me, this would be your opportunity. It's supposed to be decent weather on Saturday. Good luck out there. All I know is that on the 615 day a couple years ago, I did the dunk tank, and that was some of the dirtiest, nastiest water I've ever been in in my entire life. So we will see if this, you know, if I do this, we will see if this is going to be more filtered water or, I mean, that water was freaking disgusting. A couple textures have texted in talking about the three on three goal, the Shifley goal, or the Shifley to Connor goal last night, saying, We don't play fluky three on three hockey in the playoffs, so I don't think it matters. And I don't. I mean, breakdowns are breakdowns, guys. And that was a breakdown last night. You cannot have breakdowns that lead to odd man rushes with elite players against Spencer Stasny in the playoffs or else that puck ends up in the back of the net. Because let me just say this. When you played Vegas and Roman Yossi had that beautiful play where he whipped his way around the goal and put it in the back of the net, I didn't hear anybody saying, well, it was three on three, so it doesn't count. We don't do the selective around here. 
breakdowns with good players get you beat. And it will get you beat against a Dallas team that has five goals or five guys that have scored 20 goals. One texter says, how much money will Rex Rhodes spend on the dunk take? By the way, I got yelled at by Joe before the show today. For what? So Joe this morning, so Dane Brugler puts out his draft guide every year, The Beast, and it's a very informative draft guide. And he puts it out every year, and if you're a subscriber to The Athletic, it gives you this passcode that is as obnoxious as a passcode for a Wi-Fi device that gets set up in your house that you then have to change. It's as obnoxious as that. And so there's this big passcode. You have to put it in there, and then it gives you access to the scouting reports and everything else. It's kind of like ESPN+, Plus, right? And Joe was like, I don't want to read all this stuff on the air because you have to pay for it in The Athletic, and I don't want to get in trouble. I'm like, look, man, I've got a subscription to this thing, and so if I want to read it, I'll freaking read it. Just like if I want to read what Mel Kuyper's mock draft was today, which he had Joe all going at seven to the Titans, whoops, sorry, ESPN+, Plus, I'm going to do it. That's what I'm paying for. If I'm paying for your product, then I'm allowed to share it. And Joe got mad because he was like, you can read the athletic all you want. I don't care if you do that, but I don't want to make my bosses mad, and I don't want to. I'm like, oh, yeah, which is funny because I had complained to him about it this morning, and then I had forgotten about it. And then when he texted me like 30 minutes ago, I was like, "Mm mm-hmm, okay. Let me tell you something, man. One texture says they could raise $500,000 with me sitting at a dunk tank. That seems a think, bit much, but... Do you think they could raise $500,000? That's a half a million dollars. That seems a, a, that seems like a lot. I mean, if we're raising five hundred. I've never been somebody that's like, hey, man, if that's going to charity, do I get a cut? But if it's going to be $500,000, you know, give the Ronald McDonald house four seventy five. Give me twenty five. That seems fair, right? I'm going to guess no. Whatever. Tyler says, in my opinion, the biggest concern from last night's game was that they dominated the game and still lost. My concern is that they get tight, and even if they are uh, loading up the goal with shots, they can't bury anything because they can't play loose. We've seen the Preds do that too many times, even if they are playing well, regardless of who the coach is. So I think last night, the reason why it took 40-something shots or whatever it was in order to get three goals on Connor Hellebuck is because Connor Hellebuck was awesome. And that's going to happen against goaltenders that are that good. That, I mean, that's how you're going to win in the playoffs. Like you're going to win because one team like Dallas is going to shoot 46 times on your net and UC Soros is going to let one in. And that's going to win you one or two games in a playoff series and that's the teetering point of this series is that game that Soros either plays or doesn't play. So I don't think it was about being tight last night. I think, again, just like we're giving Velarde credit because of that unbelievable goal last night, we have to give Hellebuck credit because Hellebuck played a Connor Hellebuck-level game. That's why he makes as much money as he does, where all these other teams are like, oh, we don't need to play the goaltender, we don't need to pay him, we don't. Well, Hellebuck played his tush off last night. Andrew says, I'm just curious, Jared, do you still want Dallas as of today? I agree Vancouver and Edmonton are bad matchups for travel and other reasons. Don't rule out Vegas, by the way. Vegas is a bad matchup for the Predators, especially if they get Mark Stone back. But, Andrew says, Dallas is on fire right now. Out, out, as of today, who out of Edmonton, Vancouver, and Dallas do you think the Predators have the best chance beating in a series? My head tells me Edmonton. Because they have no depth and they have no goaltending. My gut tells me Dallas. I don't want to play Edmonton. Every time I see Edmonton play the Predators, they win 9-1. to Every time. And I know they can't ever win anything in the playoffs. But I don't want any... I'm not risking it against Edmonton. But again, in my heart or I guess in my head, I do see them as, Dallas again has five guys, Vingan texted me this yesterday, I've been beating this into the ground, five guys with 20 goals. Edmonton's got two guys that are good, and then the third guy, Heyman, who is, in my opinion, a real estate player, 
He's got prime real estate right there with Boardwalk and Park Place, and he scored 50 goals this year. But they don't have the depth Dallas has. And they certainly don't have the goaltending because that Skinner stinks. Dave says, what's the deal with Evangelista? Ten shots. I think Evangelista's getting ready to pop. And I just, I tell Evangelista, baby, you keep doing what you're doing. I love watching that kid play. One texture says, will Mike Vrabel make an appearance if he knows you're in the dunk tank? Again, I'm just asking whether or not I should do the dunk tank. I have not committed to it. But I bet you Mike Vrabel probably would want to get a nice little throw or two in there. And when we're talking about $500,000 that somebody put into the tax line, it's getting a little ridiculous. But he's somebody who has the money to do that. <laughs> 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Chris Sanders will join us next. Brian Callahan today talked about a need for the team and how there are guys on the team he's interested in seeing but left somebody curiously out. We'll ask Chris Sanders if that's a big deal, and we'll do it next. Plus, we've got to get Chris in on our big draft discussion, which we will do as well. Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. You know I love Hiller. They take great care of my home. They can do the exact same for you. Smile and save this month with Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical, because from now, until April 30th, take advantage of big savings on home systems. Enjoy up to $1,500 off select new HVAC systems, whole home water filtration and descalers, or select new whole home generators. If you've been waiting for the right time to upgrade or replace your systems, now is the time to do it. Visit happyhiller.com today for all the details. Hiller, you see that Preds logo right there in the center of the ice, that Happy Hiller logo on that Bridgestone Arena ice. That's Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. Proud support is the Preds. And, of course, the Vols and Vandy. Hiller, call the Happy Face Truck today.
When you look at your group of wide receivers after adding Calvin to that group, um, how open are you to still adding to that room? And are there any skill sets or traits in particular that you feel like you might currently be lacking? No, I think you're always open um, to adding note to those spots. I mean, we, we have to have someone emerge for us um, at, at the slot position receiver when we're in 11 personnel. That's one that um, we got some, some young players I'm excited to take a look at uh, with obviously Cal Phillips. Uh, Mason Kinsey's been around here a little bit. He's shown his, his meadow. Obviously, uh, Nick Westbrook, Akine, has been involved in some of those spots over his career. So um, trying to find someone to merge in that spot, you know, you got guys that you're trying to always build youth and depth as well. And so those things are uh, in constant flux. You're always trying to have another guy ready to roll. You need depth at every position. That's not just, just the receivers, but um, you're always open to those guys. And again, guys that are fast, explosive, and physical, you can't have enough of them. There you go. That was Brian Callahan today. And so I asked about, you know, hey, Calvin Ridley's in the mix. You need more receiver. Yeah, we always need more. But I'm interested to see in Kyle Phillips, Mason Kinsey, and Nick Westbrook-Akine. Chris Sanders is with us on the program now. Chris, did you notice a name that was not included yeah. by Brian yeah. Callahan in that? It was Traylon Burks. What yeah. do you make of it? I don't really make none of it because, uh, I mean, you know, everybody doesn't look at him as a slot receiver, but I still think he can play the slot receiver. I just think that for Traylon Burks, what he has to do is, you know, uh, he's got to go in there and just talk to the coach and say, listen, I want to learn every position. And, and Callahan made a perfect example of having 11 personnel. That's one back, one tight end, three wide receivers. I would ask him, let me play the slot in the camp. Let me play slot in OTAs. Let me be slot so I can be familiar with what I'm doing. So now if he does that, he can build trust, and now they don't have to go and get a slot guy. So I think it's less about the slot and more about the fact that he didn't even bring him up at all, right? Because Hopkins is going to be out there, and Ridley's going to be out there, and you right. only get so many active receivers on game day and right, right. all these things. Yeah. And I, I have had the theory, you know, Chase texted me after the press conference, and he said, I think you've been right all along. I thought when they signed Ridley, what they were going to do was after the draft, mm. they were going to turn around and trade Traylon Burks. And I still think that. And I, I just get the vibe by him not mentioning Burks. I, I don't think Brian Callahan's stupid. I think he did that on purpose. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh... I mean, you can say that, but maybe he forgot. I don't know. But I'm, I'm going to give you a perfect example. In 1998, you know, they were doing the draft, and they were talking about who they were going to draft, and they were talking about receivers on the roster. They never mentioned my name, but that wasn't like I was going to get cut or something like that. I just had to go in there and prove that I'm worthy. So maybe, I don't know, maybe this is a head coach just really poking a bear to, to wake him up because at the, at the end of the day, there was something that they saw in trading birth to draft him in the first round. And I think that – the, the wide receiver coach Tok Tobert and, and, and the offensive coordinator needs to pull that out. So I don't really know why he didn't say his name. I can't speculate on that. But at the end of the day, if he comes in and does his job, I think he can do some things. So I'm going to make a comment that's going to seem very judgmental, but this is a very football-related yes. comment. And sure. that is that I saw last year, you know, the the story came out for the first day of OTAs. Paul Karski wrote it that – Traylon Burks couldn't get out of Arkansas to get back in time. There were no mm -hmm. rental cars to be had, and sure. the flight was canceled. So he flew on some small Cessna plane, and he showed up on time because he was so dedicated for OTAs. And Burks said at OTAs last year he was in the best shape of his life, and you could right. see it in his body, and it looked that way in minicamp the way he played. And then he had the injuries in training camp and the season and everything else. Mm -hmm. I saw a video of the Titans players rolling into work yesterday or whatever day it was, Monday, rolling in for the first day. And they yeah. had Levis walking in, and they had Snead walking in, and Ridley walking in, and, you know, all these different players. They had Burks walking in. Hmm. The face size that I saw on Traylon Burks compared to the, the what, what I saw the last what? year, the, the size what? of his face. What? His cheeks. Come he looks on, fat. Come on, Jared. Jerry, come on, Jerry. Jerry that's that's the point I'm Jared, making here. Jared, what? Jerry. No, that you can't go you can't go by that saying a, a guy's overweight because of his cheeks. I mean come that's on, hey, last no. year he didn't have it in the face, Chris. No. And again, no, gotta, this isn't this isn't older, a judgmental these, thing. This Jared. is a football thing. And Jared, I'm wondering been, if after the offseason that he had last year, <laughs> he didn't put in the work this offseason. Jared, Jared, how can you say that? This guy his listen. And, and I'm just going through the mentality of a competitor. 
and I really believe that this guy's competitor. I know he understands what's at hand. They, he automatically went from the from uh, a starting receiver to being the third receiver. So as a competitor, I am not going to come into camp out of shape. I am not going to come in camp not prepared. And I think this guy right here, Traylon Burks, knows what's at stake. So I don't think that he's not going to work out and run routes and do the things that he's supposed to do because there's a lot at stake. So I know, <laughs> I know people are looking at that and say, well, his cheeks are big. That could be the angle of the camera, Jared. You can't, you, you can't go by that. I want to jump through this phone and kick you in both your kneecaps. Have you seen both the video? Them, not one of them. Have you yes, seen the I've video? Seen yes, he looks exactly like he looked last year. He's just a big dude. No. He, listen, listen. Hold on, hold on, Jared. There is, listen, this is what you got to understand. There's so many things at stake for this kid. It's, this is not, well, I'm a first-rounder, and I'm guaranteed to make the team. He's got to play so well in OTAs. He's got to play so well in camp to make the team. So I don't think that he's going to, well, I'm just going to go on trips, and I know he got married. That's great. But he's going to come prepare because he's a competitor and say, you know what, I'm going to make sure as a professional, make sure I come in and test. So, man, no, I can't. I can't roll with you on that, big dog. Chris, I've seen the pictures. <laughs> oh and I'm not just God. talking about the video that I'm talking I've seen. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> it. It looks like he's competing at tight end right now. Stop it. Maybe you know, right tackle. Jared, Jared, I do TV sometimes, and there's some times where I'm, I look kind of swole. Sometimes I don't look swole, but maybe it's the angle of the camera. Man, what are you talking about, Jared? Dude, what I'm telling you. Somebody Stop texts it. into the text line and says, I agree, Jared. Burks looked like he'd been eating cupcakes and burgers the entire offseason. It is Man, concerning to you, me. And you know what? You know what? You know what's so, so wild about that whole situation is I hope – that Traylon Burks proves each and every one of y'all dogs wrong. Me too. I, really I hope but, he proves y'all wrong. I don't care if he's 290. The point is there's something that this team saw that this guy can come in and make plays. What well, everybody that about? saw the things that he can come in and make plays, everybody that saw that is fired, oh and the people God. that are in charge aren't even mentioning his <laughs> oh name. God. That ain't got nothing to do with anything. He's still got another chance. He's got another chance to prove it. He's got another chance to show he can be a good wide receiver. Because at the end of the day, what if one of those guys get hurt? What if Kevin really gets hurt? And Burke steps in and has 1,000 yards. What are you going to say now? His, his, uh, his unibrow's not straight enough? No, no, I'm going to tell you this right now, Chris. I think Traylon Burks needs to have the exact same mentality that you had after your season that you told me in 1997. Sure. You said you didn't sure. have a good season. And in 1998, they drafted Kevin Dyson. And yep. in 1999 and 2000, you were on the team, but you were somewhat buried yep. on the depth chart a little bit. Absolutely, And there was yes. an injury to this guy, and Carl Pickens, sure. you know, was inconsistent, and Yancey Thigpen was always hurt, and Dyson tore his ACL, yep. and now here comes Chris Sanders and Derek Mason into the lineup, yep. and those two guys were better than the guys they had before. I agree. But I don't think everybody is built like you and Derek that when the team signs a Calvin Ridley, you guys say, well, fine, we'll just still, the cream will rise to the top. I don't Absolutely. think that everybody's built like you guys. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and I, I agree with you, but, but I, I just watched Traylon Burks. And when he was doing some interviews last year, there, there's something different in his eyes. Yeah, he's disappointed. Yes, you know, this situation is going on. And I know he has a talent, but here's the thing that's missing. I just think that the, 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 the receiver coach, uh, Mr. Tobert, the, the wide receiver coach for the Tennessee Titans, he about, oh, let's don't talk about 11 personnel. Let's don't talk about 21 personnel. Let's talk about your psyche. What do you want to do? Here's a blank piece of paper. Here's a blank piece of paper right here. What's your goals? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to be? And when he writes those goals down on the play, on the paper, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to challenge you every single play to make sure you obtain what you can do. That's all he's missing. He's got the ability. He's got the hands. He's got to stay healthy. But if somebody pours into this dude and pulls out greatness, it's going to surprise you, TD. Uh, Jared? I hope you're right. Chris Sanders is with us. So everybody gets a vote on this. We are kind of going yeah. through our draft situations ahead of time. Here's the first one. I want your vote on this. The Titans yeah. are on the clock with the seventh overall pick. Joe Alt and Malik Neighbors are both available oh, on God. the clock. Do you take the elite touchdown scorer in Neighbors, or do you take the elite non-touchdown scorer in Alt? I'm going with John Oak, Joe Oak. I'm going out 100% all day. 
But the reason the reason why I say that is because Calvin really, they got Calvin really in free agency. If they didn't, I would go with Neighbors 100%. So I would go with Joe Alt. Okay, here's the second one. Joe Alt is on the board at 7, so is J.J. McCarthy. And Minnesota offers 11 and 23, so they're two first-round draft choices, and 108 in the fourth round oh, for God. 7 and 38. Do you take it, or do you take Joe Alt? I would I would, I would take the uh, I would take what Minnesota was giving us. The reason why is because I know Joe Alt is the cream of the crop, but there's still some some other guys like Mims from Georgia. You got Latham from Alabama that can still play just as good as Joe Alt. So I would trade down and get some extra picks and get one of those guys that's available at the left tackle. Does Mims not worry you about his lack of playing time? You know, I think it's seven starts he had yeah. in Georgia. I do, and, and I, but but here's the thing that I love about the whole situation is you got uh, Bill Callahan that specializes in you know helping guys you know with their technique with the offensive line. So you got a big guy that has a lot of potential, and I think that Bill Callahan can pull out that potential because he worked with a lot of great offensive line guys. Chris Sanders, as always, joining us on our program, <laughs> Traylon Burke's biggest supporter. Oh, oh my! Oh, I went from Tanny Hill to Traylon Burke. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Chris. As always, love great you, stuff. Appreciate love you too. You, Take Bye-bye. care. Chris Sanders joining us in the program. Let me say this. On the Burks front, right? Like, I saw the video. I saw some pictures a couple weeks ago on Instagram. I'm concerned. And before you say, well, Jared, you're not skinny either. You're right. But I don't play in the NFL. That's the deal. I I am worried that Burks has not had the commitment that he has had in the past. And I think that Brian Callahan did not just exclude Burks' name today on accident. 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in on that one. I guess we'll add that to it. 615-737-1025 here on the program. There is something about the draft that I still do not totally understand that everybody is telling me is going to happen. I just... I don't see it, but everybody says we'll get to that coming up next here on the program, 615-737-1025. Chase and Big Joe have your chance to qualify to win a pair of tickets in the Eurostone Club to see Jeff Dunham this Sunday at Bridgestone Arena. This contest is brought to you by Green Trees Company, a family-owned cannabis company and dispensary, providing high-quality legal THC products for anyone seeking medicine, wellness, or relief. Located in Hendersonville with a new location in West Nashville, available online at Green Trees, T-R-E-E-Z, greentreescompany.com. Tune in tomorrow between 9 and 11 a.m. for your chance to qualify.
Stillman and Company, 1025-1063. The game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. So Mel kuyper has got a new mock draft out, and Dane Brugler's got his big draft guide out at the Athletic, the beast that's come out. And in Mel's mock draft at ESPN Plus, behind a paywall, Joe, he has J.J. McCarthy going with the fifth overall pick to the, to the Minnesota Vikings in a trade with the Chargers. Minnesota has two first-round draft choices. They trade up. They get J.J. McCarthy to be their quarterback to replace Kirk Cousins. And yet, as I look through Dane Brugler's draft guide, not that Dane Brugler is the end-all, be-all, or anything else, but he's got the grade at the bottom for J.J. McCarthy of round one slash two. Not a round one grade. Brugler has J.J. McCarthy as the 21st overall player in the draft. Mel Kuyper last week on his big board made J.J. McCarthy the 14th player on his big board and said, this isn't where I like him, but it's where, you know, people in the league think he's going to, he goes, he's going to go in the top six, Mel said. He goes, but he's not getting higher than 14. And so I cannot get over the J.J. McCarthy smoke. This is all very important to the Titans because obviously if J.J. goes within the first five picks or J.J. goes within the first six picks, then that pushes a player that is probably more representative of the top five or six, pushes that player down to the Titans at seven. So on one hand, I think about it like this. Minnesota didn't acquire a second first round pick for fun. This wasn't something that they went about their business a couple weeks ago when they acquired Houston's first-round pick that Houston has from Cleveland for Deshaun Watson. It wasn't like Minnesota picked up the phone and made that trade because they don't have a purpose in mind for adding that second first-round pick. They did it after Kirk Cousins signed with Atlanta, so clearly they're thinking quarterback. But then in my head, I'm thinking about all the big boards and everybody else. And again, 21st overall from this draft analyst, 14th overall from that draft analyst. And I'm thinking in my head, if you want J.J. McCarthy, you should be able to pick J.J. McCarthy with the 11th pick. Because he's not the 11th best player in this draft. And so then the question is this. If Minnesota's really going to trade up, If they're going to trade up to four, Rick Spielman said it's going to be a one, it's going to be 11, 23, a one next year, and maybe even more to get to four with Arizona. If it's going to be five with the Chargers, maybe it is just 11 and 23. But regardless, if it doesn't work, you're fired. Kyle Shanahan lucked out that they pulled Brock Purdy out of their tush to have a franchise quarterback who, again, we don't even know if Purdy's that good, but they at least have somebody young that they can say, this is our quarterback that makes up for the three first-round draft choices Shanahan lit on fire for Trey Lance. So in my head, I'm thinking, like, why don't you just wait until the 11th pick and pick him, right? Again, the people say, and I don't know how true this is, but I think it's probably true, people say that Kyle Shanahan moved up to three, because he wanted to draft Mac Jones and then got spooked out of drafting Mac Jones, so he decided to take Trey Lance. New England waited until 15 to take Mac Jones, and he was still there. And even then, Mac Jones wasn't good enough. But at least they waited, and they didn't go forward, like they didn't add you know, picks and everything else. So, are you really willing to get fired for J.J. McCarthy? Like the same J.J. McCarthy that we watched on Saturdays at Michigan that was a game manager who made some nice plays here and there, but that was a team that ran the football, and like, you're really going to get fired for that? Now, here's why the J.J. McCarthy stuff's really important. Because, again, J.J. McCarthy at Florida, Arizona slot to Minnesota – pushes one of the top two receivers down. Thus, the Chargers at five now have Marvin Harrison Jr. They're done. And Malik Neighbors, who I know we talk about the top three, 
of Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze, but it really feels like it's the top two of Harrison and Neighbors. The Giants, who have Darius Slayton and Jalen Hyatt as their starting wide receivers right now, can just boop, pick up the second receiver. If there's not a trade, then what most likely happens is quarterback, 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 wide receiver at four to Arizona. They don't have any receivers. Wide receiver at four to Arizona, wide receiver at five to the Chargers. Now... Do the Giants go with a Dunze at six, or do the Giants get out? Because it's much easier for these teams behind you to pop up to six to take Joe Alt ahead of you than it is for them to go up to four to take Joe Alt ahead of you. And then I'm starting to think, well, if J.J. McCarthy's on the board at six, do the Giants take J.J. McCarthy? Because even though they have Daniel Jones... They clearly don't want him to be their quarterback. But then they have nobody to throw him to. And I am just so... I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. I am just so conflicted between everybody telling me, like looking me square in the eyes and saying, J.J. McCarthy is going in the top six which I want to happen. And the reality of everybody is saying he's not the sixth best player. He's not the eighth best player. He's not the 10th best player. Again, in the case of Dane Brewer, he's the 21st overall player. And everybody's telling me he's still going to go in the top six. Minnesota's going to trade three first round draft choices for the 21st best player. I mean, I know quarterbacks are quarterbacks, and if you don't have a quarterback, you have to get a quarterback, and I know Floyd used to always say that. But I don't, and again, I don't want to put words in his mouth, I don't think he could ever endorse the idea of drafting the 21st best player or the 17th best player or the 14th best player with the fourth overall pick and using three first-round draft choices on him. But it's all very important to the Titans because if... McCarthy doesn't go within the top six picks. Now the Giants become a trade partner for somebody if both Neighbors and Harrison are gone. And that could be somebody who wants alt. It's much easier for the Jets to trade up from 10 to 6 than it is for them to trade up to 4. So I wish I had an answer for you. You know, this is the show with opinions of, oh, this is going to happen, or oh, that's going to happen. But I couldn't tell you on this J.J. McCarthy front what's going to happen and how it affects the Titans. 615-737-1025. So we had our first draft discussion decision that we feels like everybody's kind of making. I've got a second one that I want to get to. We've got to go over all these different, you know, scenarios. We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025. 106.3 106.3 The Game, again, 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in on our program. Hey, uh, score big this spring with Lee Company and the Predators in the 10K Power Play Giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company Home Services. Go to LeeCompany.com slash giveaway to enter, and that is the 10K Power Play Giveaway contest entries accepted until Saturday, April 20th.
So the Vikings, where you spent the last several decades, I believe, including the general manager for 10 plus years, let's say they trade picks number 11 and number 23, and they may even have possibly have to trade a, a 2025 first rounder to, to sweeten the pot here, and they move up to number four where the Cardinals currently sit. Minnesota would take quarterback J.J. McCarthy. He would be the fourth quarterback off the board. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think when Minnesota went and traded to get that second first round pick, they're setting themselves up to go get a quarterback. They don't have a choice. So hopefully Arizona is the team and it sounds like it could be J.J. McCarthy. I know, Ryan, when we were out there on the pro day tour, just talking to some people, I heard a lot of things that Minnesota thought he had an excellent pro day up there and fits exactly what uh, Kevin O'Connell wants to do from an offensive standpoint. But they're not going to get it for just the first two round picks. They're going to have to throw in their first round pick in 2025 plus some more draft capital to do what they have to do to go up and get it. So if they go get him, I don't think he's the fourth overall best quarterback in this draft or best or I shouldn't say best quarterback, best player in this draft. But if you have to have one, then you're going to overpay to get one. I think he's going to be a good pro, but I think they're going to overpay if they have to go up and get him. Okay, that was Rick Spielman, the old Vikings general manager, talking about what the new Vikings general manager may have to do, saying, oh, it's not just going to be 11-23 and that gets you to four for J.J. McCarthy. It's going to be more than that. Well, is he the fourth best player? No, but... That's what you got to do in order to get J.J. McCarthy. And I'm like, are you, you can't be that stupid. Like, he can't be that good. First of all, if he was that good, and I know Jim Harbaugh, he wants to run ground and pound, but if he was that good, would Jim Harbaugh have used him as little as he did? If he was that good, would Jim Harbaugh not be trying to trade Justin Herbert to draft him with the fifth pick? Because... I mean, what would Justin, if the, if the Chargers said Justin Herbert is available, how many first round picks for Herbert? Four? Five? I mean, Herbert is a true franchise quarterback. Why wouldn't Arizona, if McCarthy was so good, Kyler Murray sucks. If, if McCarthy was so good, why would he not go with the fourth pick to Arizona? So that takes us to draft decision number two. Right now, we're working through the first draft decision. Neighbors versus Alt, if they're both available at seven. Trevor says Alt. Ian says Alt. Chris Sanders says Alt. Here's the second draft decision. What if McCarthy's there at seven? And I do think Minnesota wants him. Or Denver. Or Vegas. And the offer is the trade I've been talking about with Minnesota Seven and 38 to Minnesota for 11, 23, and 108. Yes, you're giving up maybe Joe Alt with that pick, but you could still get Olu Fashnu at 11. Can still get maybe Roma Dunze, Brock Bowers with the 11th pick, and you absolutely are getting a first round tackle if you're on the board at 23. Plus 108 gives you that extra fourth round depth piece and you need depth. Because that makes more sense for McCarthy moving up from 11 to 7 than moving up from 11 to 5 or 11 to 4 for a guy who might be the 20th best player in the draft. So Ian, do you want to make a ruling on whether or not you do this or do you want to wait until we ask everybody else? Chris, by the way, I already asked him when he was on the show last hour. Chris said he would make the trade. I don't... 738 for 11, 23, and 108, huh? Alt's on the board, by the way. And Alt is there. There's no telling who you get at 11 at that point. I'll have to think about it for a few. Okay. Add that to the list of draft decisions we have to make. 615-737-1025. And I heard Brian Callahan say that's what they're doing now is they're going through literally every scenario that might happen so that they can make those decisions so on draft night they already have it figured out. We're going to do the same thing. Phone lines are driven by WilsonCountyHunter.com. Chad is up next on J.J. McCarthy. Thank you for calling and waiting. What's up, Chad? Well, on J.J. McCarthy, here's the thing. Nobody knows, right? You don't know how a a guy translates to the NFL. That's why this argument, anybody who has said, 
that that Herbert would be traded, like Harbaugh would make that trade, is insane because you don't know. You don't know. There's a reason that nine teams passed on Patrick Mahomes. But he you knows. Have no idea. You have no idea how he JJ, knows. He doesn't know how he's going to translate to the NFL. That's he's his not quarterback. That nothing is going to get you. Nothing is going to get you fired quicker than trading a true franchise quarterback, a true franchise Herbert, and bringing a guy that doesn't translate the way you thought you do because you thought he knew. You nothing don't think you that Jim quicker. Harbaugh knows how J.J. McCarthy will translate to what it is that he will ask J.J. McCarthy to do. You don't. It's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. He Jim say, Harbaugh well, has more thought, information I, on J.J. McCarthy than any other coach in football, and it is not even close, and everybody knows that. Kings, uh, Kingsbury had, had Mahomes, and he, he, was, he didn't know how he was going to translate to the NFL. He's been at both levels. You don't know. There's unknowing. Well, first you of all, Kingsbury's you know. an idiot. Secondly, like more importantly, everything. we're talking about you Harbaugh. You're contrarian. You're contrarian. It doesn't so matter think, what somebody again, says. And the it, it the, makes you an the amateur entire point of because this. Because you're such a contrarian. What am I, what am I being a contrarian about? What am I being you're a contrarian about? If I, I've called up and said Rick Spielman's one of the worst GMs in the game, and you completely flip and go the other way. Somebody calls up and good says, general manager. I think Justin Jefferson's a good player. Says, I think I, Christian Darrisaw is a good player. I think those teams yeah, they built player. in I, Minnesota I, I were pretty you. good. The yeah, team that got exactly. the NFC title game. The and you, team don't that look at the whole, the you don't look at the whole body of work. He's got the worst track record of any NFL in modern day era of quarterbacks. He couldn't find a quarterback. That's why he doesn't have a job. But you go to one. But he signed Kirk he Cousins, good, and, and Kirk Cousins just signed for forty five million amateur, dollars. And I want you to be good, but you're an amateur because you're short minded. You only look at one argument. Amateur hour. Amateur hour. Chad, this is the top show in the in the city right now. Like, I'm sorry, but you say what you want on this. Here's what I'll say. Again, I don't even know what the point of the call was. The reality is, when it comes to J.J. McCarthy, I don't see it. Now, I'll be the first person to say I haven't studied him the way that I studied the quarterbacks last year because the Titans are not looking for a quarterback this year. But when it comes to J.J. McCarthy and it comes to whether or not he'll work in the NFL, Jim Harbaugh knows because Jim Harbaugh knows the player. Jim Harbaugh has coached this guy for three years at Michigan. He knows him inside and out. There's a guy by the name of Bobby Greer. His son, Chris, is the general manager of the Miami Dolphins. His other son, Mike, is the general manager of the San Jose Sharks. And Bobby Greer was the general manager of the New England Patriots. And in 2000, Bobby Greer took a trip to Michigan. And he asked Lloyd Carr about his quarterback, Tom Brady. And he said, tell me about Tom Brady here. Like, what, what are we, you know, what are we thinking here? What are we? And Bobby Greer says that Lloyd Carr stood up on that table and says, you have to draft. You have to. You have to draft Tom Brady. Because Lloyd Carr knew what Tom Brady had inside of him. And that's the thing about these guys is that for the most part, yeah, you can meet with him at the combine and you talk to people that know him and you talk to his high school coach and you bring him in for a top 30 visit and everything else, but you don't know. There's no way. There's not enough time to know on these things. But Harbaugh's been with him for three years. Harbaugh is an offensive coach who has coached both in the NFL and has coached in college. And unlike Cliff Kingsbury, he was actually good at it. So if Harbaugh is convinced the way that it sounds like Minnesota is convinced on McCarthy because they're going to risk their career to trade up for J.J. McCarthy. When they've got Sam Darnold at quarterback right now as a bridge QB who's not that bad, but they're going to risk their careers on J.J. McCarthy. Harbaugh knows if this guy is a superstar or not. So if he is, why wouldn't Harbaugh want it? You can't be for sure. I mean, I you mean, can have a pretty good idea, but you don't really know for sure. You can also be unsure about Herbert, right? What's he won? And I like Herbert. You I mean, mean I love Herbert. You mean if you're Harbaugh? Yeah, I like Herbert. I mean, I think Herbert is great. Now, I'm not Eric Eager who I love 
at Pro Fo- or at uh, Sumer Sports used to be Pro Football Focus. I'm not Eric Eager who thinks that Herbert and Burrow are the same, but I love Herbert. I do. But he didn't want anything yet. And I said after Herbert signed that big contract last year to get $52 million bucks a year, I said, okay, now the days of, well, that was Brandon Staley's fault. Those days are over. You got to start winning. They're paying you $52 million a year to win, and he still hasn't won. So if Jim Harbaugh thinks, oh, my God, J.J. McCarthy, this is the most perfect guy in the world, he could get four or five first-round draft choices for Herbert, why would you not do that? The idea of Jim Harbaugh not knowing about J.J. McCarthy and yet Minnesota knowing about J.J. McCarthy so much that they trade all those draft choices when they don't have one one millionth the amount of information on McCarthy that Harbaugh would have is, again, another reason why none of this makes any sense to me. Old guy getting mad throwing Rick Spielman under the bus. Rick Spiel- I thought Rick Spielman was a good general manager. Was he a great general manager? I don't know. But I thought Rick Spielman was pretty good. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. We're back to your phones next. Plus, we do, speaking of Spielman, there is one thing he said that I do want to get to at some point. We'll do that later. Spielman and Company, 1025-1063, the game. Let's talk about Window Nation. That's right. April is here, and if your windows will not open for fresh air or seal tight to keep out pollen and bugs, then talk to Window Nation. Because right now, for every two windows you'll buy, you'll get two windows for free. That's right. There's no limit to how much you could save. Plus, you could save even more with no interest or payments for 24 months. With proven quality, you'll get affordable windows that meet or beat the national brands. Do not miss out. Again, when it comes to Window Nation, give them a call. Because, again, they're giving you two windows for free for every two windows you buy. Plus, zero interest and no payments for 24 months. Call 866-90-NATION or visit windownation.com to schedule your free in-home estimate. That's 866-90-NATION or visit windownation.com to schedule your free in-home estimate today.
our goal is to try to give people a reflection of where we think these players are going to go. How much of J.J. being at 14 is how much you like? the gap, closing that gap between Drake May and J.J. McCarthy. That was my goal in terms of that ranking, moving it. I did, didn't feel comfortable with a huge gap between J.J. and Drake. So it really had nothing to do. We know he's going to go probably in the top six overall. So I think when you look at the gap between Drake May and J.J. McCarthy, I wanted to close it a little bit. That's why he's at 14. He's not going to get any higher. That's as high as he's going to go. So he's at 14. We know he's going to go in the top six. To me, that's overdrafting. So I wasn't going to push him up any higher. But I didn't want to have McCarthy at 25 and Drake May in the top 10 on the big board. Didn't want to have that differential there. That's why I made that move. So Mel Kuyper just said that, hey, J.J. McCarthy, he won't rank higher than 14 for me. But he's definitely going top six. And, Ian, you just had a reaction to that. Well, yeah, he says we know he's going top six. Do we know that? I mean, everybody says it's going to happen. Like, I can't tell you. I can't tell you why it's going to happen. We don't know that. Mel knows it. Does he? That's why he's pumping him up in his big board. He doesn't even think he's good. He's just pumping him up in his big board because he thinks he's going up there. That's what Mel said. And then Mel, it was almost like Mel's negotiating with his big board when he's like, he's not getting any higher than 14th. Okay? Okay. I'm telling like, you, I'm not going to do it. I, I'm telling you right now, he's not getting higher than 14th. I, I mean, I, I got him at 24, but everybody tells me he's going to go top six, and I don't want to look like an idiot when the uh, 24th guy goes off the board with the sixth pick. So I'm just telling you right now, he's going top six, but I, he will not get higher than 14th for me. It's like, then is he really going to go in the top six? If he's that not good? Like, I, I don't get, I do not get this. That being said, it's only good for the Titans if this happens. By the way, TD texted me and said that he could not believe that I would say that Sam Darnold's okay, which I think Sam Darnold's okay, and that I would say Kyler Murray sucks. And TD does not want me to say this on air. He said, as a friend, he does not want me to say this on air. And TD, I love you, but I'm going to say it anyways. I'm putting it out there. I think Sam Darnold is better than both Kyler Murray and Tua. And I will die on this hill. And I go back to the end of the 2022 season when Carolina, who was a freaking dumpster fire for the first half of the year because Tepper and Matt Rule and Baker was just designed to fail, and Tepper fired Matt Rule, and they got rid of Baker, and he went to the Rams, and Tepper, you know, stopped paying attention because he had given up on the season, and he was all worried about drafting Bryce Young, and Sam Darnold went 4-2, and two, and he got Carolina back into that playoff hunt, and he and DJ Moore were awesome, and then Tepper came in and screwed it up all again. I thought Sam Darnold, like the job that Baker got, the bridge job in Tampa Bay, I thought Darnold was going to get somewhere else. I thought Atlanta was going to sign a guy like Darnold, and then if Ritter had stunk, they'd flip it over to Darnold. They didn't. They signed Taylor Heineke, and now Arthur Smith is the offensive coordinator in Pittsburgh, I think, because of that. I am a Darnold believer. I believe that Darnold has had nothing but bad coaches in his career with the Jets, where everybody goes to die, and Carolina with Matt Rule and Tepper, and I think the one time that everybody got out of his way, he had by far his best season, and I think Darnold is okay, and I think a year in San Francisco is good for him. And I tell you right now, I would not mind Sam Darnold as the backup to Will Levis here. I wouldn't. I mean, I, I will die on this hill of Sam Darnold. There you go. Also, it says Sam Darnold played in 10 games last year. How is that possible? 10 games? Backing up Brock Purdy. Did I miss some? I don't know. All right, Robert's up next here on our program. Thank you for calling and waiting. What's up, Robert? Hey, I I think the if if you can get the swamp of picks and you can pick up three for our first rounder with two Minnesota, man, that'd be ideal. But I you don't can't see do that. Any way, I don't that's, see any way possible it's going to happen. That's not the trade. The trade for three first rounders is for them to move up to four. To take J.J. McCarthy. The no, trade I mean, for you is a lot well, less. Yeah, but two first-rounders and a fourth. Right, but I you also that, have to give I them 38. That, yeah, I think, oh, we'd have to give them our 38? 
Yeah, no, you'd have to I give them your second that. rounder. No, no, they wouldn't. They would never get to. They would never get to my spot if that was the trade. Okay, I don't think that. I think it's going to go though. The Chargers. Jim Harbaugh's got more safety in his position than any, just about any coach other than Andy Reid in the NFL right now because he's just been hired. I think that's where the trade's going to happen because he can fall back, gather what he wants, and nobody's even going to question it because he's rebuilding the team right now. So, so I, Robert, I, I appreciate your call. Gonna take his spot. I appreciate your call. So everybody's like, oh, I'd love to make a trade. And I'm like, you got to give 38 back. Oh, I don't want to do that. You have to give 38 back to the Vikings or else they'll just trade up further. You get 23. So you're moving back four in the first round from 7 to 11. But you also move up, you know, to, to 23, which is pretty good. So the important part of that is that what are the positions that the Titans really need help at? Right? Receiver and tackle. And this is a deep receiver and a deep tackle draft. So what this trade allows you to do is that you're going from the best left tackle. If you make this trade with Minnesota and Alts on the board, you're going from the best left tackle because the Jets are probably going to take him at 10. You're going from the best left tackle to the second best left tackle and Fashnu who should be there at 11. You know, how big of a gap is that? To me, that's a question for Bill Callahan. And today, Brian Callahan made it pretty clear that Bill is doing a lot of evaluating and laying out notes and breakdowns for the scouts and everything else, it wouldn't surprise me if these decisions about, okay, do we trade back from seven? You know, where's Alt? If if Alt's a 10 out of 10, where's Fashnu? Because if Alt's a 10 out of 10 and Fashnu's a 9 out of 10, and then Bill Callahan says, I can coach him up to be a 10 out of 10, then let's trade back and get some pay, everything else. But the reason why I like this trade so much about the 7 and 38 for 11, 23 and 108 is one, you get the extra player, right? 108. That is not a bad pick. It's not a great pick, but it's not a bad pick. It's a fourth round draft choice. And then you'll have two high fourth rounders that in theory you could package up and move up something or you could move down at 23 again or you can do whatever. But the way I look at it is you don't have a starting left tackle. You don't have a starting right tackle. You need some help on the defensive line. You need an inside backer, which, again, you can probably get later if they're going to put the green dot on Hooker's helmet, which I think they're going to do. To me, that 23rd pick gives me a tackle that absolutely will not be there at 38. And I said in the mock that I did on Friday, I'm going bang, bang, left tackle, right tackle in the first round, and I'm done with it. But maybe you guys don't value tackle as much as I do. Or maybe you think that Kingsley Suomataya or one of those guys can be fine at 38. One texture says, Harbaugh is a run-first coach. He was not interested in having his quarterback exploit his potential as a passer, so J.J. is somewhat of an unknown and a passing capability. He throws the ball hard and with a tight spiral. The big question is can he arch the ball and take something off the fastball, but he is fast with a 4 5 40, and he is a tough, capable runner. So I understand the idea about Harbaugh being run first, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it and everything else. But what position did Harbaugh play in the NFL? Quarterback. Jim Harbaugh's quarterback. Guys, these coaches that are quarterbacks usually favor the quarterback. It's the coaches who weren't quarterbacks, like Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells, that are always getting into it with Phil Sims. Because they don't put they don't empathize with the quarterback. But the guys that were quarterbacks, we're talking about Josh Heupel here. You know, it's all quarterback all the time. Sean Payton, it's all quarterback all the time. That's what, Harbaugh's a quarterback. So if Harbaugh, and and this is just my opinion, if Harbaugh had a quarterback that was all that in a bag of chips at Michigan, he would have played that quarterback like he was all that in a bag of chips. I just think that maybe McCarthy wasn't, you know, all that and a bag of chips. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. So Rick Spielman brought up a guy in the first round we have not talked about at all. 
when it comes to the first round and it comes to the quarterbacks and it comes to, and Rick Spielman says, this guy is a much higher on NFL boards than he is on media boards. Which again brings me back to, so then what's up with the love for JJ? We'll get to that next. Stillman and company, and then we're to your phones. 1025, 1063 the game. And if you didn't know, Michael Penix Jr. knocked his pro day out of the ballpark. I think he ran in a four fours or low four, high four fours, low four fives. They said he had an outstanding pro day over there. So I think he, and I agree with you, is a legit first round pick.
So the difference between JJ and Penix isn't wide enough for you to feel good about giving up the farm to, to move up, correct? No. No. Especially the way Penix has been going uh, through this whole pre-draft process. He is uh, a lot more, I think, liked than maybe you've heard out there. Some of the teams I've talked to, and especially the way he's been in meetings and how he ran at his pro day and how his medicals came out, I think he's going to be climbing rather than them declining on draft boards. There you go. That was Rick Spielman on his podcast with the first pick, and he's saying, hey, don't forget about Michael Penix Jr. And then Michael Penix Jr. crushed his pro day, crushed the meetings, crushed his medicals, I, I guess. I mean, he's what, he's got bad knees or something like that? I mean, I'd like to have some more information on that before I just say, oh, okay. But, that again, Spielman's saying, hey, the NFL teams I'm talking to are saying that it's going to be a lot better with Penix and his draft stock than what people are making it out to be and that the gap between him and J.J. McCarthy's not that big. So if the gap between him and J.J. McCarthy's not that big, then why would Minnesota trade everything to move up to four to get J.J. McCarthy? Like, I can't understand. I don't understand any of this. I understand the idea that if you don't have a quarterback, you have to take quarterback. So New England at three has to take whoever Washington doesn't take it to. I think Washington will take May, but I wouldn't be surprised if they take Jaden Daniels. No problem there. But when I go back to thinking about, and again, I, I have not studied J.J. McCarthy, and I'm not going to. Because, again, the Titans aren't looking for a quarterback. And it takes a lot of work to do that. But if he and Penix are close together, then Minnesota at 11 can sit there and say, okay, we can wait to get closer, again, to seven, where relationship ran and Quasi Adafo Mensa, the general manager in Minnesota, go back to San Francisco together. And maybe they make a trade there that is more beneficial to Minnesota than the trade up to four with three first-round draft choices. Or just wait and take Penix. None of this makes sense. So either everybody's being lied to, and really nobody likes McCarthy that much, or they really, really do like McCarthy and all this smoke is real, and if that's the case, good for the Titans. Because then that pushes one of these receivers or alt to the Titans. What it really does is it pushes one of the receivers to the Giants one of the Harrison or neighbors to the Giants, which then keeps the Giants from trading that pick so that somebody else would get it and take Joe Alt. And then you could take Alt at seven. One taxer says, JS, what are you smoking? Sam Darnold better than Tua? If so, Levis should be second to Sam Darnold. Ian, back me up on this. I have been on the Sam Darnold is better than Tua train for a while. I don't know about the better than Tua train, but you do you have like Darnold for a decent little bit. First of all, I think Tua sucks. Yeah, you don't like Tua. I think Tua freaking blows. Like, I think that Tua, again, people were considering Tua a bust. Remember Brian Flores started him as a rookie midway through the year and then benched him at the end of the year? And then after year two, the owner got suspended because he was tampering with Tom Brady and uh, Sean Payton. And so it was like he was trying to get rid of Tua. And then Mike McDaniel comes in. They trade for Tyreek Hill, the best wide receiver in the NFL. And Tua, against bad teams, goes out and dominates. But then when the chips are on the table, Tua stinks. Tua stunk versus you. Tua stunk that last game of the year against Buffalo with everything on the line. Tua stunk in the playoffs. And remember what happened to you. Or excuse me, what happened to Tua in your game. Ian, remember what happened to the Dolphins early in the Monday night game against the Titans. They took the lead. Tyreek got hurt. Remember, he hurt his ankle, and then they shot it up at halftime, and he was going to try to come out and play, and I think he caught one ball in the second half. To me, Tua's a nobody without Tyreek Hill, and if you give Sam Darnold Tyreek Hill, which he never had when he was with the Jets, 
You give him Tyreek Hill, I think Sam Darnold do some pretty good things. You give him Mike McDaniel as a coach, I think he'd be doing some pretty special things. That's why I want to see Sam Darnold quarterback in Minnesota this year with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison and Kevin O'Connell as the coach, and then let's see if he can play. But don't tell me what happened with Adam Gase in New York or Matt Rule in Carolina tells you Darnold's no good when Rule got sent out and Darnold was great at the end of 2022. Had a higher QBR in 2022, the six starts he made, where he's four and two with that Panther team that had given up midway through the year and they got him back into the playoff chase, had a higher QBR than Aaron Rodgers. I'm, so if you guys think I'm going to jump on the Tua bandwagon today, you're cra- I think Tua stinks. I think the Dolphins, I'm like, if I were the Dolphins, I'd tell Tua, I'll give you 30 million a year and that's it. Well, the going rate for a young franchise quarterback is 50 million. Right. And you ain't that. You ain't Herbert. You ain't Jalen Hurts. You ain't one of those guys. Ellie's up next on Michael Penix. Thank you for waiting. What's up, Ellie? A, a couple of things. You know, number one, Michael Penix, I think Denver is in love with him. He's accurate. He's a perfect quarterback for Sean Payne. And I wouldn't be surprised if they trade up with Atlanta to move up. Because I also think the Rams are interested in him. Seattle are interested in him. He's going to definitely be a top 10 pick. And J.J. McCarthy... The best he's going to be is Alex Smith. He doesn't have that much talent. The worst he's going to be is a Mark Sanchez. Sam Donald has more talent than J.J. McCarthy, and he will do better in Minnesota than J.J. McCarthy. I would not trade up. And the third thing is, I think Drake May is the only quarterback that Minnesota might tra- trade up for, and they're just hoping Washington takes Jaden Daniels. And I hope any quarterback that goes to Washington, they're going to be a fuss because their offense coordinator, Cliff Kingsbury, is a joke. He hasn't developed any quarterback. He had Patrick Mahomes. And he had to sit out a year because Cliff Kingsbury taught him nothing and did not develop him. He was the same when he went in, and he's the same when he went out of Texas Tech. Thank you. I think Cliff Kingsbury stinks. Like, I'll tell you right now, Ellie, thank you. I will tell you right now. Let's say that the day comes, and right now it doesn't look like this will ever happen, but you never know in football, that the Tennessee Titans hire Cliff Kingsbury to either be the head coach or the offensive coordinator of the Titans, and you will see me go crazy like you have never seen. I think he stinks. And I don't know why people think he's a good coach when clearly I think the results speak for themselves. Here's what I'll say, though, about the one thing he said that I do think might be true. I think it would be a little off. I think it'd be a little crazy for Minnesota to acquire all this firepower and trade up to four with Arizona to take J.J. McCarthy. Would it be that crazy if Arizona acquired all this firepower to trade up with New England at three to take Drake May. Because the the big question is who does Washington want it to? We know Caleb Williams is going number one. We don't need to worry about that. I think I've seen some reporting, and I don't know what to believe this time of the year. You all know it's lying season, but I've seen some reporting that New England likes McCarthy and doesn't love May. But Drake May is a much better talent than J.J. McCarthy. And I saw Dan Orlovsky say that Minnesota would love to get their hands on Drake May. That Drake May is the perfect Kevin O'Connell quarterback. And I don't know, you know, how true that is or isn't. I can't tell you what is. But I could see using all that draft capital to go up to three to get May. And if New England doesn't like May, then that way they don't have to take a quarterback they don't like. They go back to 11, and then they could take Penix or McCarthy or Nix or whoever. That I could see. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in. I think Brian Callahan's a bright guy. I think Brian Callahan's a bright guy. I think Brian Callahan is good with the media. And today, I think Brian Callahan said something and said it on purpose. And I think there's a message there, and we'll get to that next. And it's pointed at one person in particular. Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game.
Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. So the thing about this show that I love more than anything is that I feel like this show is truly honest in its opinions. You may not like them. You may not agree with them. You may call in and argue. But I just tell you what I think it is, what I think, and it, that, that's it. And it may hurt somebody's feelings, and it may be a little crass sometimes, and sometimes it may be something that I come to later regret. But it, it is how I feel. There are people that I like who I have crushed on this show before. There are people who have liked me that have stopped liking me because of things I have said on this show before and I accept it I'm not in the business of making friends I have friends I'm in the business of just saying what I think and honestly when people ask me about man you sound like you love your job it's because I do it's because I love these teams and I want what's best for them and I love the fact that if the Titans do something I completely disagree with I can say that I don't like it and they hear it same with the Predators so what I'm about to say about Traylon Burks is how I feel A couple of weeks ago, and let me start off by saying this. This is all about football. This is no personal anything or another. And I am not the skinniest person in the world. But a couple of weeks ago, I follow Traylon Burks on Instagram. And there were some pictures that were posted of Traylon Burks. And I looked at these pictures and I thought, man, he doesn't look the way that he looked last offseason. You know, the truly dedicated offseason, the flying that Cessna plane to be there the first day of OTAs, the asthma's not a problem anymore, the best shape of his life. I mean, he got up there, did a press conference, and I looked at his body, I looked at his face, and I was like, he looks in shape. You can see it. Well, those Instagram pictures I saw a couple weeks ago, I kind of saw the opposite. The Titans posted a video on Monday of the team on their Instagram account, of the team going into the facility. And there's Levis going into the facility, and there's this guy going into the facility, and there, and I don't know who half these players are, you know, just by looking at them, you know, without their numbers and helmets and things like that. There's Legereus Sneed going into the building. There's Calvin Ridley going into the building. You know, they all got their little Titans iPads, and they're walking into the building for the first day of work, and there was Burks. And Burks looked, again... A little big. So Brian Callahan today met with the media. He was not asked a question about Traylon Burks, but he was asked about the wide receiver position, and here's what he said, and here's who he left out. When you look at your group of wide receivers after adding Calvin to that group, um, how open are you to still adding to that room, and are there any skill sets or traits in particular that you feel like you might currently be lacking? No, I think you're always open um, to adding note to those spots. I mean, we, we have to have someone emerge for us um, at, at the slot position receiver when we're in 11 personnel. That's one that um, we got some, some young players I'm excited to take a look at uh, with obviously Cal Phillips. Uh, Mason Kinsey's been around here a little bit. He's shown his, his meadow. Obviously, uh, Nick Westbrook, Akina, has been involved in some of those spots over his career. So um, trying to find someone to emerge in that spot. You know, you got guys that you're trying to always build youth and depth as well. And so those things are uh, in constant flux. You're always trying to have another guy ready to roll. You need depth at every position. That's not just just the receivers, but um, you're always open to those guys. And again, guys that are fast, explosive, and physical, you can't have enough of them. Mason Kinsey got the shout out, but Traylon Burks didn't. Brian Callahan, in my opinion, is a bright guy. And I think he's very media savvy. I don't think it's an accident that Brian Callahan left Traylon Burks out. And you might say, well, Jared, he doesn't play the slot and he, well, if he wants to be on this team, he better learn. Because DeAndre Hopkins is going to be outside at one position and Calvin Ridley's making $50 million to play the other position. So if he's going to get on the field, he better learn how to play the slot. So Mason Kinsey got the shout-out. Kyle Phillips, who has been as equally injured and showing flashes of production with a 
overall heaping of a lack of productivity, like Burks, gets the shout out. Nick Westbrook Akine, who's getting every drop of juice out of his orange, he gets the shout out, but Traylon Burks doesn't. This also comes on the heels of something that Callahan said at the Combine that stood out to me about how Traylon Burks needs to take better care of himself. Asked about the injuries. And I thought to myself when he said it, wait a minute, hold on. Traylon Burks did everything in his power, or at least that was the message that was presented to all of us last year. Traylon Burks did everything in his power in order to have a good season last year. And he looked the part at OTAs and minicamp. And he looked the part early at training camp. And I remember when he got hurt in Minnesota and just thinking about how unfair it was that this kid who had freaking put everything in to righting the wrongs from the previous offseason is dealt the unfortunate hand of that knee injury right before the start of the season. I didn't think effort was a problem with for Burks. Injuries happen. It sucks. It's unfortunate. But I didn't think that Burks chose to be injured last year. And then Burks re-injures the knee. And then Burks gets concussed. Just like the year before when Burks got concussed and Burks got the turf toe injury and everything else. And I'm like, those aren't personal choices to be hurt. But I do think there's a disconnect there between Brian Callahan and Traylon Burks. And I don't think it's an accident that Brian Callahan didn't mention Traylon Burks' name. You know, it'd be one thing if he was asked a question about Burks, about how do you feel about Burks, you know, do you think that he's going to be a part of this offense, do you? And that would give him the opportunity to say something like, he really needs to step up this offseason, or, you know, hey, uh, we have got to count on the guys that can be reliable, and so far Traylon hasn't done that, and we need that, something like that. But he wasn't asked about Burks. He was asked about the receiver position. And he shouted out Mason Kinsey. And talked about wanting to see Mason Kinsey. This reminds me of last year when Mike Vrabel, I asked Mike Vrabel about how nervous he was about the right tackle spot going into training camp because Nicholas Petit Frere, a.k.a. PT. Because PT was suspended. And Vrabel said, I'm not nervous. I'm excited to coach these guys. Remember, he was talking about, well, we got Jamarco Jones and we got Chris Hubbard and we've got OJ. And remember, I'm like, OJ? Who's OJ? Well, when you're talking about trait, when you're talking about Mason Kinsey, no disrespect to Mason Kinsey, who is like a, a solid practice squad punt returner, we got problems. Traylon Burks was drafted in the first round. He was drafted to replace AJ Brown. And this coach rather talk about Mason Kinsey than talk about Traylon Burks. And I just go back to the pictures that I saw on Instagram and the video I saw that the Titans put out on Instagram. And I'm worried about Burks. And I'm worried about whether or not he's going to be on this team. I think there's a chance he's not going to be on this team. And it reminds me of, see, here's the thing about us bigger guys. One of my best friends pitched in the major leagues. We went to college together. And this guy, he can't gain weight. Like, if he tries, you know, like, if he loses sight of his diet, he loses weight. He told me he was going to pay his strength coach when he was in AAA. He was going to pay his strength coach $5,000 if they could get him up over 215 or whatever it was. He couldn't do it. Well, us bigger guys are the opposite of that. Kevin Love once said that, yeah, I get on the plane and we're flying somewhere late at night and all the guys on the team are, you know, drinking wine and having, you know, pizza and, and I've got this salad from Whole Foods because I got to watch everything I eat. And it sounds like Burks is one of us bigger guys here that probably has to do that. 
And it would not surprise me if he showed up to the first day of workouts. Brian Callahan's already disappointed. But I don't think it's an accident that Brian Callahan left him out. I think that was done on purpose. And if it was an accident and Brian Callahan just forgot about Burks, that tells you something there too. That is not a good sign. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. We'll get to your phones. 615-737-1025. And, uh, boy, did someone get mad at me about this. We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025-1063, the game. The face size that I saw on Traylon Burks compared to the, the what, what I saw the last what? year, the, the size what? of his face. What? 
his cheeks. He come looks on, fat. Come on, Jared. Jared, come on, Jared. Jared that's that's the point I'm Jared, making here. Jared. What? Jared. No, that you can't go, you can't go by that saying a, a guy's overweight because of his cheeks. I mean, that's, on, hey, man, last no. year he didn't have it in the face, Chris. No, and again, no, gotta, this isn't this isn't older. a judgmental he, thing. This Jared. is a football thing. And Jared, I'm wondering if after the offseason that he had last year, he didn't put in the work this offseason. Jared, Jared, how can you say that? This guy, his listen, and, and I'm just going through the mentality of a competitor. And I really believe that this guy's competitor. I know he understands what's at hand. They, he automatically went from the from a, a starting receiver to being the third receiver. So as a competitor, I am not going to come into camp out of shape. I am not going to come in camp not prepared. And I think this guy right here, Traylon Burks, knows what's at stake. So I don't think that he's not going to work out and run routes and do the things that he's supposed to do because there's a lot at stake. So I know, <laughs> I know people are looking at that and say, well, his cheeks are big. That could be the angle of the camera, Jared. You can't, you, you can't go by that. I want to jump through this phone and kick you in both your kneecaps. That was Chris Sanders earlier today. He got mad about it. I pulled up an off-season press conference picture of Traylon Burks, and then the picture of Traylon Burks walking into the facility from the Titans Instagram. Ian, I sent him to you, and what was the excuse you gave me, you thought? Well, first... You know, it's hard to tell. Like, it's it looks like it. Is it a screenshot of a video of Burks? So, both are screenshots of videos. Both are screenshots of videos. Okay, so you know they're like moving, and it's hard to get a good angle. But I said something. You know, maybe he had his wisdom teeth taken out. Maybe he had his wisdom teeth taken out. That's the excuse we have from Ian. Perhaps that, some dental work that, on this look, angle. Again, I, look, I am not the skinniest guy in the world. I've struggled with my weight my entire life. I used to be so, 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 so fat in high school and probably emotionally have never recovered from that. So I'm not sitting here telling you that, like, I think it's so easy to be in shape. But I'm also not paid millions of dollars to be in shape. And that is the big difference here. And I just, again, I mean, it looks, to me, it looks pretty obvious that Burks is not in the same shape he was last year. And when Brian Callahan talks about receivers and he leaves him out but shouts out NWI and Mason Kinsey, that's not a good sign. And let's not forget that now all the people that risked their careers by trading A.J. Burks for Traylon Burks, all those people aren't here anymore. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. Brian Callahan is not tied in any fashion to Traylon Burks. And so what's it, you know, to him? If the guy's out of shape, he's out of shape. Dustin in Nashville says, pretty sure the Burks picture is related to a facial hair change, though I like that type of insight. So I did look at both pictures. Last year, Burks had a goatee with a little bit more of a beard. This year, he just has a regular goatee with less of a beard. I don't think it has anything to do with the facial hair. Kyle is up next. He's been waiting patiently on Traylon Burks. Thank you for calling, and thank you for waiting. What's up, Kyle? Hey, good afternoon, guys. Yeah, Jared, I'm kind of with you. Whenever I'm uh, working out, people can tell. They're like, your jaw and your neck and your cheeks. I can just see it in you. You're working out. You're, you're in shape. You're losing weight. All this. I can just. That's exactly what they go to for me, so I know what you're saying there. And uh, that was not an accident by Callahan. It's very calculated, like you said. So uh, that's I think it's motivation. But also, if in case it's not, like, is that talking to Burks, letting him know, hey, buddy, you could be traded on draft day. And I don't think Burks would hate that either. I think it's his way of basically saying, I don't care about you. And whether exactly. it's his way of saying, Kyle, thank you, whether it's his way of saying, I don't care about you, from the standpoint of, hey, that should motivate you, that he doesn't care about you. Or whether it's just, I don't care about you. That's the message. If he did that on purpose, and I think he did, that's the message. You know, it's like, again, and the reason for the why a coach would do something like that could mean many different things. 
You know, Barry Trotz came on our show yesterday and talked about how there's no pressure on the Predators and there's more pressure on Vancouver because they got the Canadian media and that there's no pressure and fans don't get on our team if things don't go well in the playoffs because our team was not supposed to be good this year and all those kind of things. And I think Barry Trotz is doing that on purpose. I don't think that Barry Trotz cares how the fans feel if they get mad if somebody, you know, takes a dumb penalty and ends up in the box. I think Barry Trotz is saying that, hey, you know, everybody, you know, don't. And we have nothing to lose because he wants his players to think that. Because in this instance, he thinks that's the best approach to take with them mentally. And with his 25 years of coaching, you know, he probably does know a thing or two about how to motivate guys, you know, how to push them, how to comfort them. You know, the different kind of, uh, you know, when to be hard and when to be caring. And so I couldn't tell you the reason for what Brian Callahan, you know, why Brian Callahan would do that or kind of what the second reason for that would be. But what I can tell you is, again, if Callahan purposely left Traylon Burks out, it is because he wants to send the message that he doesn't care about him. That's the message that he wants to send. The, I couldn't care less about you. You want to show up out of shape? That's your business. I don't need you. I'm worried about the other players. I'm worried about the guys that I think, because I'm the coach, I'm worried about the guys that are going to help us, like Phillips and Kinsey and NWI. And I'm trying to think of who's some, like, down the road. Kiaris Jackson. I'm worried about those guys. I don't even know if Kiaris Jackson's still on the team anymore. But I'm worried about those guys. I'm not worried about Traylon Burks. Traylon, Colton you Dow, play, baby. Bring us Colton Dow. Oh, forgot about him. Seventh he's rounder. He's still, he's still uh, on the team. Yeah, but he's probably not going to play this oh, he year. Got hurt he tore that ACL at like the last game of the year. I forgot about that. So he probably ends up on the pup list or mm-hmm. something like that. Bummer. Texter said, Chris missed the fact that it could go the other way, too. Two seasons of playing for Vrabel and Downing and Kelly could have, and Kelly could have these older receivers brought in to replace him in a horrible offense could take a toll on a guy's confidence. He may have gotten... A bad case of the screw it's, although I said screw it's, and that's not what he wrote. Um, so it reminds me of something years ago, just again, a story I remember where Chipper Jones talked about how he was getting up in age and he, you know, he never watched what he ate and he was one of those guys who could eat whatever and it didn't matter. And then he got in his 30s and was like, okay, now I got to really watch what I eat. And he spent an entire offseason watching what he ate. He showed up to spring training. Everybody told him he was in great shape. And a month into the year, he got hurt. And the next year, he was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Because it didn't help me. So here's Burks, who last year, you know, was all in on trying to, you know, really focus on being in the best shape possible because of how he showed up to rookie minicamp and everything else. He does it. He gets hurt. He has a bad season. Everybody's dumping on him anyways. It's like, well, you know, I, I did it your way and it didn't work. So why not just revert to what I want to do? And I could see that. The problem is, is that, you know, the rubber's meeting the road. And I really want Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks has a special kind of talent on this football team that very few players have. I mean, his first practice, the first training camp practice for the 2022 season was a Traylon Burks highlight reel practice. And he had some games like that his rookie year where he made some superstar plays. But he just, he just couldn't. It just hasn't manifested itself in any form of consistency. 615-737-1025 is our phone number here on this. Mel Kuyper Jr. has his latest mock draft. It is out, and it's a two-rounder. And what he's got the Titans doing? We'll get to that next here on Stillman and Company. FanDuel Sportsbook is my official sportsbook app. It is playoff time, or at least soon to be playoff time, in the NBA, NHL, and baseball is now in full swing. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks 
all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash JGM and make your first bet an automatic win. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash JGM. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. At my official sportsbook app. 21 and over in present Tennessee. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is not withdrawable. Bonus bets that expire seven days after. CT terms at sportsbook.fandle.com. Game and problem called Tennessee Redline at 1 800 889 9789. The O-line's the big problem field. Certainly a, a speed receiver is needed, but the offensive line has to be addressed. That's where you hope, if you're the Titans, either Joe Alt or Olu Fashionu are still there on the board. That, to me, <clears> is the <throat> biggest problem they have. If you got a franchise young quarterback, you can't keep getting beat up. Remember, Will had issues at Kentucky that final year yep. with a bad mm-hmm. offensive line. Comes to Tennessee with a horrible offensive line. Can you give this kid a break and you help him out and keep him healthy for the entire season? The O-line, to me, is the biggest problem for the Tennessee Titans. Mel Kuyper Jr., his latest mock draft is out. No surprise at the top. Caleb Williams, number one. Jaden Daniels, number two to LSU. Drake May at three to the Patriots. Again, no surprises. Marvin Harrison Jr. at four to Arizona. Then Minnesota makes the trade for J.J. McCarthy at five. Here's what Mel wrote, by the way, about that. I've talked about how I just don't get this J.J. McCarthy thing. Mel writes, uh, okay. Here we go with my first projected trade. I have to believe it was the reason the Vikings made the deal last month with Houston to acquire a second first rounder. They needed extra capital to move up. This trade, Minnesota, would send 11-23 along with a first round pick next year. Oh, God. In order to uh, take J.J. McCarthy. He says, at this point in the process, based on everything I've heard, I don't think the Vikings can afford to wait till 11 if they want one of the top four quarterbacks. I have McCarthy at my big board at 14, Mel writes, but I can see on the tape why a team might take him in the top five. 
Malik Neighbors at six to the Giants. And Joe Alt at seven, according to Mel Kuyper Jr. No surprise there. Let me say this. The NFL draft is almost never chalk. It is almost always, you know, a surprise. And the surprises happen kind of early, right? Like, I keep seeing all of these mocks. They kind of look the same. You know, it's going to be Caleb Williams one, and then Mayor Daniels two, the other guys three. Then there's a trade at either three or four. Then whoever doesn't trade for J.J. So if J.J. doesn't go at four, he goes at five, and Marvin goes at four. If J.J. goes at four, Marvin goes at five. Neighbors at six and Alt at seven. It's never, ever, ever going to be that simple on draft night. I can't ever remember a draft where I'm like, man, this is exactly the way that everybody just felt like it was going to be. And that's why I keep seeing all this stuff and I'm like, man, I remember being at the draft in 2019. And we were on the stage doing the show, me, Floyd, and Derek. And the first pick, no surprise, Kyler Murray. The second pick, no surprise, Nick Bosa. The third pick, no surprise, Quentin Williams. The fourth pick was Cleland Furl out of Clemson, who we had been talking about as a target to the Titans at 19. Look, Mel's very good at what he does. And I even tweeted this out over the weekend. I have an unbelievable amount of respect for Mel Kuyper Jr. Because I truly feel like Mel doesn't do this job for the money. Mel doesn't do this job for the vanity of being the guy of everybody wanting him on a show. And how when you think draft, you think Mel Kuyper Jr. Mel Kuyper Jr. does this out of his love for scouting the South Dakota State right tackle. And I can appreciate that. ESPN could pay Mel a thousand dollars. They could pay him ten million. And Mel would give you the same effort because he loves the draft. So I know Mel really, you know, this is what he's, it's never going to be like this. And we all know that. So what I'm trying to figure out is, okay, what makes sense here and what's kind of off the board here and what's, what are going to be the kooky and crazy things that happen? Mel also, in this mock draft, it's a two-round mock draft. And Mel has the Titans at 38, taking Ricky Pearsall, the wide receiver out of Florida. Mel writes, the Titans signed Calvin Ridley to a big contract, but 2022 first-rounder Traylon Burks has disappointed over two seasons. Don't show Mel the Instagram video. And DeAndre Hopkins will be a free agent next year. There's room for a young wideout on the roster. Pearsall had 98 catches and nine touchdowns in two seasons at Florida. And his 4-4-140 at the Combine solidified himself as a top 50 pick. He's got Lad McConkey out of Georgia going one pick below. I've heard a lot of good things about Pearsall. TD, I think, has said a lot of good things about Pearsall. Rick Spielman has said a lot of good things about Pearsall. So I don't have a problem with either of those picks. But I just, again... I just know it's not going to be that simple. But everybody is lining it up this way. Caleb Williams won. We all know that. Jaden Daniels or Drake May two. The other guy three. And I really think that's how this is going to go. Then if Arizona trades at four, quarterback goes there, right? Nobody's trading up to four to draft the left tackle. So if Arizona trades, it's J.J., and then Marvin goes at five to a team that doesn't have a receiver. If Marvin goes at four, then they trade for J.J. at five. It just is never that simple. Every year, there's one of these that's a wow. Cleland Farrell at four to the Raiders over Josh Allen, who just signed for $150 million today. By the way, good job, John Gruden. Daniel Jones went at six, and people were shocked in that draft. So I'm not dumping on Mel, because again, I think Mel's great at what he does. It's just, this is kind of the consensus of how this first round's going to break until you get to seven. And I just don't, I, I just, history tells me. It's not going to be this way. Kyle in Shelbyville says Mel was right last year about Levis. Well, Mel compared Levis to Troy Aikman. 
And I like Levis, but I'm not convinced that Levis is Troy Aikman, at least not yet. Like, I'm right in the middle on Levis, which is I think Levis deserves an opportunity to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. And then let's see if Levis makes it. He's got a lot of traits I like. He's got some things I don't like. But I'm not going to say, some of you guys want to say, oh, he's cute. He is a franchise guy. Whoa, we're not there yet. Houston can say that about their quarterback. You can't say that about yours. But I do think that Levis is a legitimate starting quarterback. You know, somebody, when I was talking about how much I like Sam Darnold, and I said I'd love for him to back up Levis. It's like, you'd say that he should back up here, but you'd put him as a starter ahead of Murray and Tua. Yeah, and I'd put Levis as a starter ahead of Murray and Tua, too. I mean, that's just, you know, make of it what you want. Texter says, when it comes to uh, trailing Burks, maybe Burks will perform better a little out of shape. Last year, he was in tip-top shape, probably overworked himself, leading to those soft tissue injuries. He had a knee sprain. Like He had a knee sprain and a concussion. That's not a hamstring. Add in the signing of Ridley and the neighbor's talk, he obviously has checked out a little mentally. Let's see how he does, but the cards are definitely stacked against him. I mean, look, man, if Traylon Burks were to ask me, like, Jared, what do you think? Like, what do you think I need? You know, what do you think? I'd say Traylon Burks. I think I was in favor of the trade for you. I was. And I know that a lot of people that were in favor of that trade, they don't have their jobs anymore. But let me just say this. I'm rooting for you, but I'm betting against you. Because I am certainly not betting for Burks. I have operated this entire time as if Burks wasn't a factor in any of this. Like, well, they need a receiver, and then they said, okay, yeah, but I'm not like, well, they got Burks now in there, and apparently the coach isn't that way either if he's not going to mention him when he talks about Mason Kenzie. Paul says, the draft is a huge conflict for me. I want the Titans to improve, but I love when you lose your mind after a bad pick. Well, I just think about it like this. Let's focus on the long-term gains as as opposed to the short-term enjoyment of my Dylan Radins and Monty Rice meltdowns. And my Peter Skaronsky meltdown last year, which the jury is still very much out on. 615-737-1025. It is official. Coach Cal is a hog. What the crazies in Kentucky have done, and did Coach Cal try to work his way back in? We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, right here, 1025-1063, the game.
Cal. I don't know if I use the word cold feet, but he had second thoughts. <laughs> okay? I, I, I think that's fair to say. He had second thoughts. I think it's fair to say that they met. He met with some U.K. officials at his house. Dick Gabriel said that he asked for a counteroffer. He has now walked that back and said that, that didn't, it wasn't a counteroffer. Um, I wasn't there, so I can't say. But if Dick walked it back, I'm going to assume that wasn't true. But I do think there was a meeting of, is there a way to sort of bring this back together? And it sounds like the U.K. people said no. Okay, that was Matt Jones today on Kentucky Sports Radio saying on Monday, Calipari got a little nervous. And, oh, do I, am I going to take the job? And the U.K. people said, take the job. If that's the case, good for U.K. It was time with Calipari. Like, it was time. I said it after they lost to Oakland. It's time to fire Coach Cal. But, Jared, it'll cost $33 million to fire him. We can't afford to. I was like, I thought it just meant more. I thought Kentucky basketball was the place where, oh, everybody wants to be here. Everybody wants to. And Kentucky was going to bring him back. This was going to be for a one-shot deal. And if it didn't work, they were going to fire him. And so guess what? Calipari gave them the out. Now, The Athletic has done one of those, you know, kind of like that Joe and Diana Rossini article about why Vrabel got fired, where we found out that the New England comments that Vrabel said got all mad at me about, and Joe said was a nothing burger, actually did piss the owner off a lot and was a big factor in a lot of this. I'm just saying. That uh, apparently they've done one of these where Friday, Arkansas's athletic director, Hunter Juracek, who I think is a freaking loser, uh, Hunter Juracek, was talking to Calipari about what candidates to hire and then said, why not you? And Cal was like, well, I, I guess I haven't thought about this. Anywho, The Athletic writes that uh, industry sources briefed on the terms told The Athletic that Calipari signed a five-year, $38.5 million contract with Arkansas with triggers based on NCAA tournament appearances that could push the deal up to seven years and almost $60 million. Calipari took the job because he knew that he was owed 33 million bucks by UK and he probably wasn't getting a dollar more. And that short of getting back to being Calipari, he wasn't going to make any more money and he was going to be fired after a year and he'd have to sit there and collect a check and be on the SEC network. And he didn't want that. So he went somewhere where they'll roll out the red carpet for him. And that's Arkansas. They're going to pay him. And again, when it says NCAA triggers, that probably means that Cal's money's going to roll over. He's going to get these easy, you know, easy to achieve incentives that'll probably make it closer to 60 million bucks. Cal's going to walk away with a lot of money. And Cal's going to walk away with being a coach until he's 70 years old, which is probably what he really, really wants because I'm sure he can't picture anything for himself other than being the coach. And that's why he's giving up one of the best three jobs along with Duke and North Carolina in college basketball. Now to the U.K. side of this. Good for U.K. You got what you wanted and you didn't have to pay anything. Now the candidates that people are talking about with U.K. are Danny Hurley, who has said he's not going to take the job. Billy Donovan, who I know is not going to take the job. Jay Wright, who said on TV he's not taking the job. And Scott Drew at Baylor. Now, a lot of people are saying that the Danny Hurley thing, don't just rule that out. He was asked on the spot, what's he supposed to say? Okay, that's fine. I still can't get over why UK can't just outbid or UConn. And people are like, well, maybe the money doesn't matter that much. And if Kentucky's offering $13 million a year, then the money should matter. I think Mike Greenberg, and I don't know where he got this of all people, but Mike Greenberg came out and said that the most UConn can pay Danny Hurley is $7.5 million a year. Well, I know UK can pay more than that. They were supposed to pay Cal 9.5. Well, if you're supposed to pay Cal 9.5, I mean, UK probably had it budgeted to pay a coach next year after they fired Calipari and still had to pay him all this money. Well, now they don't have to pay him any of this money. So they should have tons of money to go get Danny Hurley. So I can't believe 
The U.K. can't just write a huge check to get Danny Hurley, but okay, let's say it's not about the money for him. Scott Drew posted a photo at a Mexican restaurant in Waco, Texas today, and I saw them tweeting about this. He posted a photo with a friend of his at a Mexican restaurant in a Baylor polo. Apparently, U.K. fans found out what the Mexican restaurant was in Waco, Texas, called the restaurant, had a woman that answered the phone at the restaurant take the phone to Scott Drew, in which they said, somebody's called for you, and it was a U.K. fan saying, we want you to be the next coach, and apparently Scott Drew laughed and said, that's pretty impressive. The crazies are back at it. But I don't know, you know, when it comes to college coaching in basketball obviously football is different because Alabama got the guy that Washington would have been willing to keep but again it's Alabama so he took the job I'm starting to think that getting a good college basketball coach is like drafting a quarterback in the NFL which is the way you get a coach is either you get a young guy and he develops into a superstar and then he's your guy or you get kind of a guy who's been somewhere and failed a little bit. That's like Matt Ryan. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if the guy Vanderbilt hired, I think it's Byington, Barrington, whatever, the guy they hired from James Madison. Byington. Byington. It wouldn't surprise me if he ends up being a great coach, right? I have no idea if he's a good coach or not. Never met the man. Who knows? But let's say he turns Vandy around and makes Vandy what I think Vandy can be. It wouldn't surprise me if people are like, oh, well, Kentucky's calling and Carolina's calling and Vandy's like, we'll give you $10 million. bucks." And unlike James Franklin, because, again, football's different, he's like, no, I'm good here at Vandy. I think that's kind of how college coaching is now. So either you go get the young guy from Scarbini State or you get an older guy who has, quote, unquote, failed or been fired or it hasn't worked out somewhere else, like Rick Barnes, like John Calipari, like Rick Patino at this point. I don't think it's as simple as, oh, that guy's doing a good job at a Power 5 school? Take him. I don't know if that works anymore. Gunner is up next here on Calipari. Thank you for waiting. Go ahead, Gunner. All right, Jared. Uh, first of all, I agree with you everything you said about Tua and Kyler Murray. But Thank besides you. that point, Calipari is a glorified promoter and politician, and most of the Kentucky fans are sick of it. And whenever it comes down to it, we most of us are ready to move on. We're not. A lot of us ain't sad. But what I'm, what I am, scared, what I'm a little bit afraid of, is that. Kentucky is going to turn into that Mike Vrabel. You know, everybody wants Mike Vrabel. Everybody would love to be Kentucky's coach. But do they really? Where's Vrabel at now? Yeah, so I hear what you're saying, Gunnar. And I think the big thing, too, and I, I learned this firsthand watching the Louisville coaching search. This is This is why you can't get these guys. The first thing is, like, a lot of these guys will sign contract extensions to get a lot of money, and the buyouts are astronomical you know brad underwood at illinois i think he's a very good coach he's got a buyout of 20 million bucks no thank you nate oates has a buyout of 18 pretty hard for me to think that they're going to be able to buy that out but nate oates took his name out right away anyway so i guess it doesn't matter so that's the first thing the second thing is what happens is kentucky calls up and this is why if kentucky's going to go get danny hurley they need to call and offer $11 million on the front end. Because if they call and say, well, you're making five, we'll pay you six and a half, we'll pay you eight, UConn will be able to convince you, well, stay with us for seven and a half, you go for eight there. UConn can't pay $13 million. But that's why the money talks. I heard Derek the other day say, if you got to pay all this money in order to get a coach, then your job's not that good anyways. I'm like, the money... Is the, is one of the reasons why it's a great job. Why do you have the money? Cause you've got the fans. Why do you have the fans? Cause you're the best. Just like the Yankees. Keith and Bowling Green, thank you for calling. Go ahead, Keith. Hey guys, uh, can you hear me? Go ahead, Keith. Uh, yeah, I'm just, 
I'm just calling to uh, say, you know, the thing with Cal Perry is there's he was so, under so much pressure. He just couldn't he just couldn't coach anymore. He was under so much pressure. I mean, he was he was coaching not to lose. He wasn't coaching to win. Here's what's crazy anyway, about I, that, I guess, Keith. Yeah, thank you for your call. Here's what's crazy about here's what's crazy about that when it comes to Cal is that Cal's biggest problem was not oh he couldn't recruit anymore oh his teams weren't good anymore oh they just couldn't win the tournament that's the problem. Jared versus Joe is next. We duke it out. Plus we'll give away Burt Kreischer tickets in the next hour. So be listening for your opportunity on that. Stillman and Company one zero two five one zero six for the game.
Stillman and Company, 1025, 163, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. It is Wednesday, 5 o'clock, which means Caroline joins us as always. Hello, Caroline. Hello, how we doing? Outstanding. Joe is with us. Joe scolded me this afternoon before I came on the air saying that, you know, it's okay for me to read The Athletic, but you do not want to read The Athletic columns on the air, Joe, because you don't want people to get mad at you because The Athletic is behind a paywall. Well, yeah, you seem to misunderstand what I was saying. I was just talking to Paul on my show, and then you start – let's tell the listeners what happened. You sent me an f bomb laden text. Yep. You say, "Well, I'll say oh. whatever I want to. I'll say whatever I want to about the athletic." Yeah, I don't care what you say. I, I shouldn't, on the day a huge thing comes out, say everything that's behind a paywall. Does that not make sense to you? So then, wouldn't it also make sense? Do? Wouldn't wouldn't the reverse be true that it would be good for you not to use your like say on a Sunday after a Titans game for you to not give your best takes in the athletic column? When you should be saving them for the morning show at seven a or six a.m. I what? So you're no, saying I, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're saying you don't want to make your bosses mad by saying things that are behind a paywall on the air for free. Well, shouldn't you want to not make people here mad by already saying things that you're going to say again at six o'clock in the morning, but writing them in a column that comes out before? No, those are two different mediums. One of them is free. One of them isn't. <laughs> Our shows are on the or over the air, Jared. It's kind of a cool thing. Did you notice? So the so the takes there you don't have to protect, but the takes that are behind the paywall you do. Yeah, Jared, it's called paywall. Okay. With that, it's time for Jared versus hard? Joe. <laughs> Jared Stillman versus Joe Rexroad. Now on Stillman and Company on ESPN 1025 The Game. Caroline, go. Oh, by the way, Jared versus Joe presented by Pella Windows and Doors of Nashville. So we're paywall shaming. I also heard that you were fat shaming earlier. I was not fat shaming. In fact, I was. I said this is not about, you know, aesthetics as much as it is about performance and football. But, you know, Traylon Burks, you saw the pictures, Caroline. He's thick. Ian says that maybe he had his wisdom teeth taken out. I mean, if we're talking about his cheeks are so chubby that maybe he got his wisdom teeth taken out, like that's where we're at. Uh, but speaking of that, Brian Callahan did not mention Traylon Burks by name in his 40-minute press conference today, but he did mention Mason Kinsey, who I learned today is in fact still in the Titans, which I did uh-huh. not know that before today. Uh, Jared, you go first. Is it a big deal or not? Looking, or we shouldn't look too much into it? It's absolutely a big deal. You know, I mean, like when it comes to the receiver position, we all know what the Titans have, right? Ridley, Hopkins. Those are the two starters. You know, that's, you don't even need to talk about them. Then after that, it's in some order, Burks, Westbrook, Akine, Phillips, and then, you know, Kenzie's kind of at the bottom of the roster there. Kiaris Jackson, you know, probably down at the bottom of the roster there. I'm sure there's some guys like Treshawn Harrison that they've signed to Futures Contracts, and maybe they'll sign some other guys too, you know, to come in and compete at the end. But the receiver room right now of guys that, you know, are NFL players are Hopkins, Ridley, Burks, NWI, Kenzie, and Phillips. And the one guy he didn't mention was Burks. And that means one of two things. Either he didn't mention Burks because he wants to send the message that he doesn't care about Burks. Like, oh, yeah, I'm talking about these guys. And I always. And I want that to motivate him to get his butt in shape or to do whatever it is Brian Callahan's asking of him. Or Brian Callahan doesn't care about Traylon Burks. Just like, oh, yeah, whatever, he's over there somewhere, you know, whatever. And that's probably worse, but also just as bad. So, yeah, I I think that Brian Callahan's a smart guy. And Brian Callahan, I think, has, you know, a great recall. You know, when I sat down with him after he got hired, we were talking about specific plays and specific games, and he can go right to that. I think he's a very, very, uh, I think he's a very good in terms of, you know, a coach of, explaining things to people. He's very media savvy. It's not an accident that he left Burks out there. I think that's very much a red flag. 
I mean, I guess it, it depends on your definition of big deal. I don't know that Traylon Burks is a big deal anyway. So is Mason Kinsey. Dis- Wait, what's that? Is Mason Kinsey a big deal? Because he mentioned no, him. No, not at all. No, but the point being, like, uh, like, yeah, I, I don't disagree with what Jared said that he may have intentionally left him out or whatever. I know it was a question about slot, so some people are like, well, Traylon Burks is outside receiver, but he needs to, you know, I mean, he should be in the mix wherever he could possibly get on the field. I'm just saying, like, Traylon Burks to me is 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 not a total afterthought, but it, like we've talked about, like, I think he's kind of gravy at this point. It's like, I mean, if he can get his stuff together and he can carve out a role and this system can work for him, good for him. But I think the Titans have to proceed. They've got Ridley, they got Hopkins, and I think there's a real chance that they draft prominently another player at that position. I mean, it, that it, the fact that that's even possible kind of tells you that Traylon Burks is already an afterthought, doesn't it? Well, I mean, it's telling me that you don't care about Burks the way that I'm thinking Callahan doesn't care about Burks, which is how I approached free agency in the offseason of, you know, when we're talking about, okay, you know, who can start it? You know, can Brunskill be a right guard? I mean, I guess he can be. Yeah, okay, pencil him in at right guard. That's fine. I never at one point considered Burks a starting receiver this offseason. Like, I never was like, well, if they don't go sign a receiver, if they don't draft a receiver, it's okay because they have Burks. That was never an option. Just like bringing Aaron Brewer back was never an option for me. That was never an option to consider him a starter. But to Caroline's point, I mean, we're talking about Mason Kinsey's getting the shout-out, and the question wasn't about the slot. The question was about adding at wide receiver. And then he started talking about the slot and then talked about those guys. But if Burks isn't going to play the slot, then Burks isn't going to play because Hopkins is going to play outside and Ridley is going to play outside. So if Burks isn't playing in the slot, Burks is not on the field. And if Burks isn't on the field, then he's not going to be active on game day because he doesn't play special teams. So uh, to your point, yeah, I mean, it sounds like they've given up on Traylon Burks. Well, again, I don't know about giving up, but I just think that, that it's – I mean, like Nick Holtz today, you know, said some – you know, yeah, he's working hard, but also, like, he's got to earn it. I mean, he's, they're already in that mindset of it, show us, you know. So I don't know that like, giving up, but just sort of like going in with the idea of we'll see, but he's got to prove something to us. Now, to, I, you may be right on his answer. He definitely was asked specifically about slot today. So just to, just to make sure that's accurate, he was asked about slot at some point, and that's when I thought he said Kinsey's name. But regardless, yeah, I mean, Tra- Traylon Burks is, is great bonus if he works out. I mean, I think we agree on that. Okay? Are we ready to say bust? I mean, you love saying – you say bust five seconds after someone's drafted, so I know you're ready. I mean, yeah, look, first-round pick on the trade for A.J. Brown, yeah, it's until further notice, sure. I'm ready to say bust. And the $50 million to Ridley is kind of what, you know, puts the stamp on that, where it's like we got to pay a guy $50 million because we don't believe in you. Bust. Caroline, what's next? All right, Joe, you go first. You are the general manager of the Titans. The Chargers select Joe Alt with the fifth overall pick. What do you do? Well, if that were to happen, I'd love to move back in the draft because if I take a tackle based on all the information that I have right now, if I take a tackle there, I am reaching at seven, taking a tackle. Um, Now, if that happens, that probably means, and I, you're not giving me all the information, so I can make some assumptions or not, but if that happens in tandem with the four quarterback scenario, then I'm getting one of those primo receivers, and that's I mean, that's going to be my, if I'm sticking at seven, that's what I'm doing. Uh, but I am I am trying, hoping someone wants to move into seven and so I can move back, still get one of those tackles, get another pick, and go from there. Sticking at seven, I mean, I guess even if it's not, okay, let me do the math here. So sticking at seven, alt's gone. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I should be good getting one of those receivers, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, if they go off the board right there with Joe Alt at five, the first thing I'm doing is I'm, and see, this is where it gets a little complicated because 
J.J. McCarthy may not be off the board in this scenario, and in this scenario, maybe he is. So let's kind of take it down the two paths. Let's say McCarthy is off the board at this point, which means McCarthy is gone, Marvin Harrison is gone, and Alt is gone, because Marvin Harrison will go at six to the Giants. At that point, I, I know everybody talks about the big three receivers. I really think it's the big two. And then Adunze is after those guys, and then there's everybody else after Adunze. I call the Atlanta Falcons who have the eighth pick. And I tell the Atlanta Falcons, I am drafting Malik Neighbors at seven. And if you do not trade up to get Malik Neighbors, and their second wide receiver is Rondale Moore, if you do not trade up to seven, you can draft a Dunze, but you're not getting Malik Neighbors. My gut is Atlanta probably deals you next year's second or a third this year, you know, something like that, in order to make that one spot move. But the targeted pick for me at this point is Olu Fashnu. Because the more I hear people not talking about Olu Fashnu, and it's just like he's kind of falling a little bit in these mock drafts, the more I'm thinking teams like the Saints or teams like the Jets at 10 are sitting there saying, hey, we may not be able to get Alt, but we might be able to get Olu Fashnu. And I've heard Trevor talk about it enough. I've heard Rick Spielman talk about it enough. I am convinced there are two left tackles in this draft that project as high-end left tackles, and Fashnu's the second one, and I want to make sure I get one of them. So if I'm at seven, Alt's off the board, and you know McCarthy's off the board, I'm offering the Atlanta Falcons the seventh pick for neighbors, and then I'm going to eight and probably taking Fashnu so that I, the Jets still don't get ahead of me to take the tackle. If McCarthy is on the board... I am picking up the phone, calling Minnesota, Denver, and the Raiders at 11, 12, 13, and I'm saying, make me your best offer for J.J. McCarthy right now. Somebody of those three is going to make a decent enough offer. I'll move back, and at that point, I may not be able to get either left tackle because the Jets might take Fashnu, but then I've got added picks for later in the draft, and I can take J.C. Latham or Talis Fuaga to be my right tackle because the Titans don't have one of those either, and then maybe wait a little bit for a Marius Mims in the first round or something like that. If I get Minnesota's second first rounder, you know, and I can get a left tackle with that pick as well. But that would be my plan is if McCarthy's on the board, I'm calling the three teams that need quarterbacks and say, give me your best offer. If McCarthy is off the board, I'm moving with Atlanta, picking up a pick, and still going with Fashnu. Well, as usual, the number of words blurted is just an absolute landslide in Jared's favor. Well, I mean, again, there's two separate scenarios here, right? Yes, Jared. Well, there's the if J.J. Like McCarthy's your, on the board, like your plans, that's a Jared. different like scenario than it is if J.J. McCarthy's not on the board. My guess is your retort really means, wow, that's a really well thought out plan, Jared, and I, I, I have said, nothing I, to say. I like your plan. No, so I I'm just going to crap have, on it because I don't have anything don't. mean to say, so let me come up with something myself. Put that I'm behind not, a paywall, Joe. More I'm Jared versus Joe. On anything. More I Jared versus Joe good. continues next. Yay, on our Jared. Yay. Did we lose Joe? Oh, I guess he ended that. Okay, Tennessee Men's Clinic, fellas. You've put this off for way too long, and it's time to get it done and move forward with your sex life. And the Tennessee Men's Clinic is the leader in bedroom confidence. The reality is that pills often quit working, and guys start making excuses for not coming to bed. Did you know that studies show that men will be more irritable and argumentative before bed just to avoid failing at intimacy? And yes, I know many of you hate going to the doctor, but the Tennessee Men's Clinic was created in 2014 to take care of guys just like you. For a decade, the urologists and providers at the Tennessee Men's Clinic have helped guys with ED and weight loss, and they now even offer aesthetic enhancements and cosmetic procedures. Their ED and weight loss treatments truly change lives with no surgery, and they are seeing success rates as high as 90%. They specialize in seeing guys who think they're out of luck regain hope that they can be successful in the bedroom and beyond they even offer same day or next day appointments give them a call 208 9090 that's 615 208 9090 615 208 9090 or go to tennessee men's clinic.com to book an appointment today that's tennessee men's clinic.com
Jared Stillman versus Joe Rexroad. Now on Stillman and Company on ESPN 1025, The Game. Jared versus Joe is presented by Pella Windows and Doors of Nashville, Caroline. All right, Jared, you go first. You get to pick in a fantasy land in the Stanley Cup playoffs. You get to hand select who you get to play in the playoffs. Dallas or Vancouver, who are you picking? I will take Dallas, and I will take Dallas for a couple of reasons. Number one, I believe that the Vancouver Canucks have the best player, the best overall big boy forward of both teams, and that is Elias Pettersson. And I am scared to death of big boy forwards because I've seen what Sidney Crosby has done to the Predators in playoff series before. I have seen what Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane have done to the Predators in playoff series before. And I've seen, even though he was a defenseman, he was basically a forward the way that Brent Burns played in that San Jose series years ago. I mean, just freaking dominated the whole time. So, the second reason that I would go with Dallas is because of the travel. Now, I remember in 2016, there was a lot of complaining about the back and forth between Anaheim and San Jose and that it caught up with the team. And I think that would be something I'd be worried about too. The third reason is the Predators lose to Edmonton every time they play them. And they lose like 5-1 to one every time they play them. You end up in that side of the bracket, you may play Edmonton in the second round. And I know you may end up playing Colorado in the second round too, but I have more faith in you beating Colorado, who you beat 5-1 at home, last month, and you went toe-to-toe with until the McDonough hit and everything else afterwards, I would say Dallas, and then the most important reason. Dallas will be looking ahead to Colorado, and Dallas thinks that they own you because they beat you 9-2, and you will have carried that butt spanking with you into the Dallas series, and we saw how they reacted to the butt spanking in Mm -hmm. live time. With the run, and I think that that'll be brought up a lot in the week preceding the series. Give me the Dallas Stars. Yeah, the 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 worst thing you said there is this this idea of they'll be looking ahead. That's just goofy as hell. That, that's that's not a that's not a reality thing. Why not? Like a Do you think that the 2018 it's... Predators were looking ahead to the Winnipeg Jets in that Colorado series? No, I think that they played the series. I mean. No, 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 no one looks ahead. In they the played in like the absolute dog crap in that Colorado series. It went six games when it should have been four. They lost right. to the they, Hamburglar. Yeah, they right. They they blew game five. Believe me, I remember because I had Beccarine no got pulled in game three. Yeah, I understand, Jared. It's the playoffs. It was Nathan McKinnon and Landis Gog and Rantanen as young players. And they showed what was coming in future years. That team was so average at that point in time. The Predators were all set up for that dream matchup against the Jets. I remember your commentary. The Punch and Judy abs. Punch and Judy abs. Blah, blah, blah. blah. I remember. And you lost to the Hamburglar. I understand that. That's that's a good reference. Um, But, no, they were not looking ahead to Winnipeg. They they got in a playoff series, and sometimes the underdog punches you, especially when they have talent like Landis, Skog, McKinnon, and Rantanen, which they did. So, no, no one looks ahead. Um, I'll take Vancouver, and I have switched on this. Uh, The travel thing, see, here's another thing, Jared. You're kind of revising that history, too. Everyone talked about the travel thing in 16 because they they went to the max, right, in both series. They went game seven out to California, and they got smoked in game seven in San Jose, and so it was kind of like this excuse of, God, they were so exhausted at the end. I mean, the other teams had to travel back to Nashville, too. I don't care about that. I like the lack of big-time experience in the postseason that Vancouver has. Um, And, look, Dallas is just playing out of their minds right now. And and if your goalie is going to play like this for Dallas and Ottinger is playing great, they are a scary team. I mean, to go into Colorado like they just did and make a statement like that and say, yep, this division's ours, I just uh, I just think Vancouver would be a better choice. So I, a, a couple weeks ago, I'm saying Dallas, and I, I agree with some of your points. I don't hate the fact that their last time they saw them was an embarrassment, and they have matched up pretty well with them in the regular season for the most part, but I'll pick Vancouver. I can't get over the fact that you don't think the Predators overlook Colorado in 2018. Dude, it's the playoffs. Why can't you understand that Like the playoffs are difficult? They are super hard no matter who you're playing. Looking ahead, so I remember the Predators got up two zero in that series. If you have one game, like a football team, 
that's playing like a total patsy. You know, Auburn plays whoever they play before the Iron Bowl. That team looks ahead because everybody knows what's next. There's one game. You know what the outcome of the game right in front of you is. That's fine. You look ahead. You don't look ahead in a playoff series. Come on, man. So I remember that playoff reality. series against Colorado, the President's Trophy defending Western Conference champion Predators. And I remember in that playoff series, the Predators were up 2-0 after the first two games they won at Bridgestone Arena. And there was something that didn't sit right with me about really both games, but especially that Sunday that they played game two and they were up 2-0. And I remember coming on the air at 2 o'clock that day and saying, I don't feel very good about how they played. I think they need to play better. And I was expecting the phones to just be a bitch fest, right? I was expecting it to be like, Jared, you're such a hater. All you ever do is hate on the Predators. That's all you ever. And instead, every phone was like, I'm with you, man. They have not played well at the beginning. Something's wrong. Then they go their game three, Pecorine gets pulled. They end up winning game four by the skin of their tush against a team that barely made the playoffs, all with young players that still hadn't really blossomed yet, and they won that game by the skin of their tush. They come home to Bridgestone Arena, which was the whole point of the season, was to get home ice. They got home ice, game five. Colorado, both goaltenders are hurt, so they have to start Andrew Hammond or whatever it is. Do you seriously have to recap the entire series? Get because your- that team had no business being on the same ice as the Predators, and right, it, but- the series went six games, and the Predators did right. not play and- well in that series until game six yep. because they were looking ahead to Winnipeg. Uh, you know what one of my favorite things to do in this is like when TD texts me during the thing? <laughs> He just texted me the laughing, crying emoji, looking ahead in a whole series. I mean, it really is so dumb when you think about it. They, Jared, if there's anything that was intangible that was part of that, and I would agree they didn't play their best, it's the pressure of being the favorite and having won the President's Trophy. Now, that okay, is Okay, then give me that, which excuse. Dallas will have. Okay, there you go. All you had to do was not say something stupid like they're looking ahead and we could have we I don't, I, they were look, they were not taking Next that Colorado team seriously and it bit them in the butt because they were not playing good hockey and they got into that Winnipeg series and it was a disaster and I will forever think that they overlooked them I mean I thought that they they played Colorado the way we talked about them on the radio and again we called them the Punch and Judy Avs which they were Predators didn't even play well, and the Predators still won the series. Caroline, what's next? All right, Coach Cal heading to Arkansas. Between Kentucky, Arkansas, and Cal, who wins? Joe, you go first. Hmm. Um, Kentucky wins. Kentucky wins. I, if I have to pick one of the three, I'm going with Kentucky. Because one, Kentucky got out of you know, 33, 34 million, whatever the heck it was. To move on, and they just they need to move on. I agree with what Cal said. Like, if you want to boil down his weirdly like analog fuzzy video that he put out uh, yesterday, they do need a new boy. Sometimes it just gets stale, and when you have as many failures as uh, he's had in recent years in the postseason, and the fan base is disillusioned, but then the fans are like, "Well, he does have another great recruiting class coming in." I think they, they needed they needed a new start, and. So to to get and now I still want to see the hire. I think it's going to be Scott Drew, and then I feel really good about saying Kentucky wins because I think Scott Drew is an excellent coach. Uh, I think Kentucky. You also fans thought Chris Mack com- was an excellent coach. Okay, I, I I don't. I never thought Chris Mack was the level of coach that I think Scott Drew is a guy who has won a national championship. But um, if Kentucky fans are complaining about that, I think they're way off base. And to to be able to kind of say goodbye, not have to do the dirty work, not have to pay the money, and be able to push that money over to Scott Drew if it is him or your new coach and all the things that he needs, uh, I think I think it's a win first for Kentucky. But look, I think I think it could be a win win win. I mean, we'll see. Uh, you know, I I think that uh, Cal will still succeed at Arkansas. He'll win, but he's gonna have to he's gonna have to figure it out in March or. It's not that many years there where it'll be the same kind of complaints. So I agree with Joe. I think Kentucky is the winner here. But the reason why I think Kentucky's the winner is because had, and I know that Kentucky has a lot of money, but the reason they didn't fire Cal was because of all the money that they were going to have to pay Cal. 
And I think there's a chance that Cal would have found a way to win just enough, you know, maybe make it to the Sweet 16 next year, the second round or something like that, that he would have stuck around. But I think the days of Calipari winning the national championship and competing for the national championship are over. And that's what Kentucky's about. And so even if this next hire is not a slam dunk, then it'll be just like Billy Gillespie where it's two years and then they move on and they get somebody else and then Kentucky will be back. To me, this was the end of Tubby Smith. And even though Billy Gillespie stunk, it was time to move on from Tubby when it was time to move on from Tubby. Tubby was a good coach there. And I think Cal was a lot like Tubby. The results are very, very similar. And the exits are very, very similar for Cal and Tubby to Minnesota. I think that Cal's going to be like Tubby at Minnesota, which is he's not going to win much. You know, he'll win fine, you know, make some tournaments or something like that. But the days of Calipari being a superstar coach at a superstar school are over. So I don't think, I think Cal took a plea deal. You know, hey, here's a $40 million contract that gets you out of the $33 million you were going to be owed and the hot seat you were on, but you don't get to coach at the Blue Blood anymore. You don't get to be the coach. You don't get to set the news cycle every day by saying something. And I think there's a lot to be lost in that. I don't think Calipari is going to be as successful as Eric Musselman was at Arkansas. Eric Musselman's elite eights. And I don't think Cal, who can't beat St. Peter's in Oakland in a tournament and can't beat Vanderbilt and A&M in the SEC tournament, I don't think Cal has the fastball anymore. So I don't think that Arkansas, I think Arkansas wanted to make a splash because they were probably a little insecure after Musselman took a USC job that USC's coach just went to SMU. So I don't think Arkansas is going to win. I don't think Cal's going to win. I think it's Kentucky. And I'm not sure Scott Drew's a good fit for Kentucky because I don't think he has the personality to kind of deal with the circus that is UK. I think they would be better off going with Bruce Pearl. I don't think they will. But if Scott Drew's not the guy, I mean, I think Danny Hurley would be the best decision. And with not having to pay Cal, I don't see why they can't offer Danny Hurley so much money that he can't say no. But I do think that Kentucky, by not having to pay Calipari, and by Calipari being the one that has you know, started this break, I think Kentucky is in a great spot because if they'd had to fire Calipari after next year, then they'd be trying to fire a coach, but they'd also have the money that they'd have to pay Cal. They don't have any of that money now. And I think Kentucky, you know, we're going to see, you know, if Kentucky yields the stick that I think they yield. But I do think that this is a good move for Kentucky. Not a good move for Arkansas. Not a good move for Cal. Caroline, who wins? It's so Kentucky. Like, Kentucky is 100% the winner. They got a um, get-out-of-jail-free card is what they got. They really did. It was honestly probably they were like, oh, you mean, like, you're going to just leave and we don't have to pay you a dime? Cool. All well, right. Ma- Matt Jones Safe said Safe travels. Matt Jones said today that on Monday, Calipari got cold feet and that some Kentucky executives or whatever came over to, and I don't know if this is, like, university personnel or boosters or whatever, but they came over to his house and – Cal was trying to decide what he was going to do and that the Kentucky people were like, go, just go. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Like, don't let us hold you back. Um, I'm with you, Jared, that I do think that this Callahan thing is, is a big deal. Like, I, I do think that it's, it's not nothing. I don't think that he went in there intentionally saying like, Ooh, this is what I'm going to do. So everybody thinks, you know, this is how I feel about Traylon Burks, but I do think that it was probably it a subliminal message of like, look, like, I don't know how much Traylon Burks is in our plans here, but I do think that your comment about the paywall is so absurd that Joe has to win. (laughs) I just think it's ridiculous that Joe can use his best takes on his paywall on a Sunday night and not save them for 6 a.m. in the morning. Oh, you're so full of it. But we can't read a paywall article on the air because you read, read whatever you want. I, I just said, read whatever you want. Jared, Do you think your bosses 90... will really get mad at you if you read Dane Brugler's stuff? Because all that's doing is it's bringing attention to Dane Brugler's draft guide that then people have to pay for in order to read the whole thing. I just know that if I have something n- new on a particular day, on that day, I'd rather like not the whole thing not be given away. That's just me. So that's how I, that's how I go about it. And as far as in a given week, Jared, 90, like, 8% of the takes that spew from either my mouth or my computer are on our station. I mean, get out of here with this save your takes 
I mean, I, I come Monday morning, so if I write a column of a game Sunday, I'm there 6 a.m. Monday before most people have even had a chance to read it, and I'm saying the same stuff. Get out of here. You know what Joe's really thank you, thank there you, saying Caroline. that 90% of the things? Joe's explaining that it's actually harder to do radio than it is to be a columnist. Just telling you, kids. Great it's stuff. definitely got to be hard to be you and, and bloviate for four straight hours. I will give you that. Somehow and I that. keep on trucking. I don't know how I do it, but maybe it's just my, you know, ability to do nothing but gossip. Great stuff, guys. Pat Jam. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> Jared versus Joe is presented by Pella Windows and Doors of Nashville here on our program. 615-737-1025. If you guys want to weigh in, 615-737-1025. Cal! is trying to set the narrative. We got to play this next, and we will. Stillman and Company, and of course, we'll get right to your phones. 615-737-1025. Stillman and Company, 1025-106 through the game.
we talked Friday. There was some stuff Saturday and Sunday back and forth. Um, we didn't talk contract more than 15 minutes total, maybe less, 10 minutes. Here's what, okay, that's fine, let's do. But I refuse to do anything Sunday or Monday because of the national championship yeah. game. Yeah. I think that says yeah. a lot. That, that, that is those players, those coaches, those schools, they deserved it. And then when it leaked out, yeah. but you notice neither one of us said one word. That was John Calipari, and he's, uh, I guess that was on Hogs Plus. I don't know what that is, but it's on Hogs Plus. I'm guessing that's kind of like the media site for Arkansas. And his press conference is going to be at 6 o'clock. And let me say this. That's the beginning of the John Calipari spin cycle. So on Monday, Calipari was walking his dog, and he said, Oh, I have nothing to say. I don't know. I this, I that. And yet Matt Jones said that, no, no, no. Calipari called Kentucky on Monday and was like, I might be having cold feet. And Kentucky said, no, 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 go. Just go. Just get out of here. Just go. Calipari's press conference which will be, again, at the top of the hour. I think it is going to be filled with so many half-truths and bold-faced lies that it will make your head spin. I mean, I can't even wait for this. And I don't care about Calipari anymore as far as, you know, when I was at Louisville and I was on the radio in Louisville, like, Calipari was the story. I mean, that was the peak of his powers. That was Anthony Davis and Carl Anthony Towns and all those great players and great teams. But the reality is John Calipari won't say this, but I will. Cal took this job because he's scared. Cal took this job because he's scared that he doesn't have the fastball anymore, that he doesn't have the answers anymore, and that he can't ringlead the circus that is Kentucky basketball. And because of that, Calipari was approached by Arkansas about potential candidates for the job and decided, you know what, what about me? And they said, what about you? Yeah, what about me? After Jerome Tang had turned down Arkansas. And I always like confidence in a guy. I also like self-awareness. I'll give Calipari credit. The next year of his life, unless they won the national title at Kentucky, was going to be a living hell. And even if they won the national title at Kentucky, it may not have ever permanently sealed the bridge between him and the fans. This is the right thing. It's just now I can't wait until Cal's press conference because I guarantee you Calipari's going to tell you all these different things about, oh, Arkansas, you know, I love it here because the NIL is so much better than at UK. Yes, at UK where he pushed out the boosters, who in turn got mad and focused on football. UK, where he said, we're a basketball school, and got into it with the athletic director, who held a press conference and said, I'll walk with you whenever, but if you don't want to be here, just go. This is a doing of his own. And I can't wait until Calipari gets up there and tells us about how it wasn't a doing of his own about how, oh no, it's the Nolan Richardson 40 minutes of hell history that has me glued to wanting to be back here. We know that's not true. By the way, as far as Kentucky's concerned, I think Joe's right. I think they're going to hire Scott Drew. They're not going to get Billy Donovan. They're not going to get Danny Hurley. I think they're going to hire Scott Drew, and I think that's going to be a disaster. Because Scott Drew, and I think Scott Drew's a good coach. I mean, he's a great coach, obviously. But, like, I got to know Bryce a little bit when he was the head coach at Vanderbilt. And I know that Bryce is not Scott, but Bryce is a good coach. And I know the Bennies that covered Vanderbilt will tell you about how terrible Bryce Drew was. And everybody will say, oh, Bryce Drew's horrible. But Bryce Drew's winning at Grand Canyon, so Vanderbilt hasn't won anything since he's last. So you see what I'm saying? Scott Drew is a great coach for a place like Baylor where you'll be respected, you'll be paid, fans will show up, but they're not going to stalk you every hour of every day. 
Kentucky's not that way. Kentucky's the Yankees. Kentucky's the Lakers. It's the Cowboys. It's Alabama football. I noticed that when Louisville went hiring their basketball coach, Josh Hurd, the athletic director, is a really smart guy. He was talking about how if you're the Louisville basketball coach, every second of every day, somebody is thinking about you. You don't get that when you're Dusty May at FAU. And no matter how much Scott Drew wins, and he's you know clearly the best thing to ever happen to Baylor basketball after the scandal that Dave Bliss put them through, he doesn't have somebody thinking about him every second of every day at Baylor. The guy who I think really can feed off the circus is Bruce Pearl. That's the guy who I think Kentucky, they're not going to do it, but that's the guy Kentucky needs. But I bet by this time tomorrow, Scott Drew will be the head coach at Kentucky. Danny Hurley, by the way, would be the slam dunk, but it just just seems like it's far-fetched for whatever reason that might be. 615-737-1025 is our phone number, 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in. Barry Trotz, yesterday on our program, had a thought about a potential playoff series. We'll get to that coming up next as the Predators have clinched a playoff spot. Stillman and Company, 1025-1063 the game. Let's give away some Burt Kreischer tickets. Be caller 5 right now at 615-737-1025, and you will be seeing Burt Kreischer at the F&M Bank at Bridgestone Arena this Saturday. Good luck on that. Stillman and Company, 1025-1063 the game.
No matter who you play, it's going to be a, a really good series, I, I, I would hope, because of the fact that they're, they're good teams, and I think we're a good team. Um, and I think you're going to have to look at them all differently, but I, I know if you go up to Canada, there's more travel, all that. Uh, there's probably more pressure on the Canucks to, to win because of the, the Canadian market and Vancouver just as a, as a market itself. Um, if you want me to ramp up the pressure, I'll ramp up the pressure. Right. I have a problem with that. No, they're, they're, I think both fan bases okay. will ramp, ramp up the pressure. I just know in, in Canada, there's, it's 24-7 uh, Vancouver Canucks. Uh, we're down, down south here. There's, you know, you got baseball. You got different, different well, we things We got left happening. tackles we got to, you know, argue <laughs> about and whatnot. That was yesterday. Ian, by the way, I take offense to Barry Trot saying that we not, we're not too hard on the Predators down here. Well, I wouldn't take it too wouldn't take offense to it too much. I mean, this Canadian teams and the pressure to win the cup up there is just a little bit over the top. Agreed. This is not Montreal. We talk about it all the time. This is the meanest show, I think, out there. And this is nothing compared to Philadelphia or Boston or, you know, the big cities. Ian, we got some news. Okay. That I want to share with the folks. Saturday night, the Predators will have that fan appreciation night. It's the last home game. They're playing the Columbus Blue Jackets. Ian, I believe you will be at the game on Saturday. That is correct. Will I be seeing you at the festivities that we will be a part of Saturday? Uh, hopefully. I, um, I'm actually going, I actually plan to go with a buddy already. Um, so working on a couple other friends going. So hopefully I'll see you guys around there. Yeah. Okay. I will be on the dunk tank on the Bridgestone Arena Plaza. At 5 o'clock on Saturday night. Okay, well then I'll, I'll try and make a point to stop by there. If you want to bring the fastball and you want to put me in the dunk tank, 5 o'clock on Saturday at Bridgestone Arena on the plaza, I don't know any other details. I don't know if this is for the fun of it. I don't know if it's for charity. I don't know what it is. But I know for 30 minutes I'll be sitting my tush up there and you guys will be trying to hit the dunk tank. So who thinks they have it? If you really, really want to exercise some demons, Saturday night at Bridgestone Arena, you will have your chance. As, again, the Predators play out the string Friday, Saturday, and Monday, because the point we are right now, I got one thing to say, Ian. Let's hear it. Get me to the playoffs, baby. Bear in. Ryan McDonough. Luke Shin, Smashville Live from Brew House 100 in Bellevue comes your way next. Stillman and Company will see everybody tomorrow at 2 and on that Bridgestone Arena Plaza at the Dunk Tank on Saturday at 5.